My name is Lakota, and I'm an American native. I won't specify the tribe. My contact information is not made public. If they were, I'm certain I'd receive many false calls, intentionally and unintentionally. My phone number is only available to the higher UPS, who determine whether my services are required. It was last night. Around a small hiking trail in Utah, several disappearances were publicly reported. It's terrible but not all that unusual. However, my higher-up noticed a few statuses on the social media accounts of the recently vanished family and friends. Some reported feeling as though they could hear their dearly loved's voice calling from deep within the woods during a memorial at the edge of the trails. The people who were watching their personal pages felt differently, and that's where I came in, even though they believed this to be a sign from God and hoped the missing would return. Skinwalkers pose a threat. They are almost always stronger than us in terms of raw strength. But what really distinguishes them as apex predator is their cunning. I was brought in as soon as I could to look into it. The police were present when I got there, and the vibrant lights were dancing around like a rave. Several beat officers were leaning against the cars, sent there to give the locals a sense that something was being done. The moment I arrived, I could tell they were miffed because this meant their quiet night of playing around would be interrupted by actual work. One said, Trails closed. The words were said definitively. I replied, I was called in to look into it. That's what we do. Let's take care of this. Simply return home. When he responded, his tone of exasperation made it clear that he wanted me to simply leave. I sighed. I'm afraid I can't do that. He then simply stared at me. Along with his teeth, I could see the gears turning in his head. When he motioned for me to join the group, I gave them all the information I could legally give them. They were supposed to allow me to do my job because I was sent there by higher authorities. However, I always have trouble confirming the authority. For obvious reasons, the paperwork I bring in never includes my contact information. But because of this, I must constantly deal with skepticism. I eventually received a compromise. I was allowed to enter, but I had to bring one of them along as a partner to watch out for me, and my gun had to be taken away. Knowing that if I wanted to go in that night, this was the best I could hope for, I reluctantly agreed. I was left to venture deep into the woods with Austin, my new crime partner. Austin was practically dragging his feet. If I thought the guys back at the cars were reluctant to talk to me, it was Austin. He never even had a chance to object to this arrangement, so it was clear that he had the lowest seniority. How much longer will we be out here? He sighed. I responded, more subdued than he was as long as we need to. We have thoroughly searched all of the trails. He argued, you're not going to find anything. I replied in a lower voice, you don't understand what I'm looking for. Then, what are you looking for? He groaned. His voice resonated in the trees. Anything within a mile could hear us clearly how things were going. He lacked the grace to blend in. However, I knew that asking him to be quiet would only result in more inquiries, so I tried a different strategy instead. Do you know what skinwalkers are? I questioned him instead of interrogating him. Of course, they're well-known legends in this area. Hikers are frequently warned not to stray too far by them. Do you know how they got there? Old indigenous legends. Are you attempting to scare me in any way? I replied, ignoring his query. Correct, the legend originates more specifically from the Navajo, a southwestern Native American tribe. He laughed at this and appeared not to want to hear any more, but I persisted. The term, skinwalker, is ye in the Navajo language and means, he who walks on all fours. 
He muttered at me when I didn't get his cues to stop talking. He didn't speak when I did, and my voice was much softer. He needed stimulation to stop moaning, and I knew that. He was obviously disinterested and bored, so I entertained him with a story. When I was younger, I used to take some of these trails. Since I was raised in a rural area, hiking was among my friends and my favorite pastimes. Yes, indeed. Numerous people did. Some pretty well-known walks around these parts. He mused, not yet paying attention to what I had to say. Well, it continued into my adult life. I would head to the trails and woods to unwind when the pressures of my job got to me. That was how I meditated. You'd be surprised at how many good people you can meet in the wild. People seem to perform better as a result of it. She must have noticed that in me. On my walk I ran into her. Nothing special. She was jogging the same trail in a heavily forested area, just doing what everyone takes for granted. We stayed together the rest of the way and haven't been able to split up since. After two years, I referred to Regina as my wife. Uh huh. Austin muttered, not yet drawn in, but at least it was quiet now. I gave Davis my love of nature when we had our son, Davis. He caught the bug just as hard as I did his age, and our family outings helped us become closer. We were familiar with the area, overly well. So we made the decision to turn off to a less traveled area. The spirit of adventure was in full force. We were confident that we could care for ourselves because of our vast experience. If we strayed too far from society, we had a lot of tools to help us. However, getting lost wasn't the end of us. I continued. Austin's brow furrowed at that last remark. I was aware of his attention at this point. He remained silent, but I sensed that he wanted me to continue. We would make camp. It wasn't noisy. At first, there was a calm. But it was precise because of that isolation that the sound of a twig snapping awakened us. The more crunches and creaks we heard, the more unnatural the silence seemed. The only thing that relieved the oppressive pressure was the sound of snaps approaching slowly. Our camp's perimeter was where we first heard it, and it then stopped. Even though we eventually relaxed, we were constantly aware of outside observers. Austin's breathing was audible to me through his nose. He would probably never tell me the truth, whether it was out of exhaustion or eagerness to tell the tale. Things felt tense the next day. We continued our journey, but the tension was constantly prickling up our backs. It only took one error in judgment, which ironically occurred when nature intervened. Davis, my son, only needed to use the restroom. He indicated that he needed to go before falling asleep, so we let him out while operating on autopilot due to severe mental fatigue. We quickly realized our mistake, but that was all that was necessary. Regina called quietly for Davis as we snuck out of the tent and cautiously made our way to the designated bathroom area. He remained silent. As panic set in, the only sound we could make was our breathing getting heavier. But a meek voice calling out quickly interrupted it. I stopped on purpose. I could feel Austin looking at me as he waited for more, which I refrained from saying. Eventually, seemingly on the spur of the moment, he blurted out. What happened next? I gave him my warmest smile and continued. Regina, it's all right. I'll be right here. Jokingly, Davis exclaimed as he took a few steps toward the campfire. Regina comforted, rushing over to grab him in her arms, saying, Thank God. It was too late by the time I realized what had startled me. I had lost all enjoyment in frightening this grown man at this point. The part of the story I detested telling the most is this one. 
I continued right away without even waiting for a response. She pulled her torso first into the shadows behind Davis's arm, which extended with more force than they had any right to. I froze as I watched this because Davis's words were still ringing in my ears. Davis didn't address us by our given names. I was kicking myself for not learning about it sooner. My teeth were clenched. Even though I had previously told this story numerous times to help people get ready for what might happen, it never became simpler to do so. I nevertheless felt compelled to wrap up my tale. I wished to pursue them. I wanted to swoop in and grab them as they were about to fall into something. They agreed with this notion. Regina and Davis are pleading with me to visit them. To protect them. To follow suit. But their rhythm was strange. They were emotionless. It was a trap. I knew that. I simply broke down in tears. After I finished the story, there was nothing but silence. As his mind processed the information I spoon-fed him, Austin's pace slowed. He weighed the words I said on his scales of skepticism, and I could almost see the gears turning in his head. I distracted him to the point where we were well into the designated trail I was to investigate, which also took a mental toll on him. I began probing him about the case once I thought he had come to terms with the fact that he was stuck with me. I inquired about the casualties, where they vanished, when it took place, what was discovered. I convinced him to make pockmarks on my map, which gave me a list of predetermined places to look. To Austin's groans and complaints, we searched for two hours. I tried my best to ignore him and proceed with my work with great laxity until I came across something tiny and white sticking up from the ground quite a distance from the trail. A tiny bone fragment. He took notice when I abruptly hushed him in a serious tone. This response seemed to be influenced by the mood I had created earlier. I looked closely, trying to determine where it had come from. Austin immediately lost his serious expression when he realized what I was looking at. You got upset about that? A bone from a chicken? I disregarded him as I looked around the area for more. He let out a sigh and decided to just remain motionless. However, I had a new goal. Observe the bone fragments trail. More were strewn in that direction, and if I was watchful and diligent, I would discover yet another piece, then another, and yet another. I eventually identified its source. A body. However, it had not just left. The body in front of me had likely been there for several months, if not years. It was covered in torn, vibrant hiking gear ribbons. Dated and decrepit. At this, the officer's head turned. He must have thought. Great, more paperwork. At that moment. For authorities, discovering a body this old is nothing but a hassle. Before, he was a chilly examination of time that had been wasted. However, I could spot a skin work walker almost anywhere. I gave Austin the most basic of instructions because I knew he wouldn't take what I told him seriously. Austin, could you please keep an eye out for something that resembles a hollowed out dog? He sighed in agreement and said, sure, whatever. I started looking more closely at the body. The first thing I noticed was the skin was completely removed. But when I looked at the bones, I saw that they had been removed. Not chewed or gnawed, but scraped instead. Oh no, I said. Quick. I yelled at Austin and pulled something out of my bag. Showed this off. I extended a mask that resembled the one I was donning at the same time. Despite the obvious trepidation I encountered, my tone and my prompt actions convinced him to follow suit and also just in time because a menacing obsidian cloud began to blow in around us. In response, I firmly covered my face. Whoa! What is this? 
Austin sputtered, but the mask masked his words. I informed him that skinwalkers create poisons from dead bodies even though I knew he wouldn't believe me. He could not deny the danger around him, but I knew he would deny the part about the skinwalker. I reached behind and slid my hand out to reveal my tiny blade. A stake-like, razor-thin dagger. Its polished silver metal flickered with a clean sheen. I peered over to see Austin take his gun out. Even though I knew it wouldn't work, I didn't want to discourage him because I believed it would, at most, serve as a diversion. I also noticed that he didn't cover his face when the cloud blew in. I felt I shouldn't have had to tell him about something, but he wasn't aware of it in time. His hands and arms must have been covered by this point because he was wailing in agony and rubbing the dust from his eyes, only making it worse. Before I could assist him, he sprinted off to escape the cloud. A novice error. I followed him out, moving more slowly. I carefully went to where he went after hearing his frantic yelling. He appeared to have gone into a frenzy due to the contrast between not believing what I had told him and being attacked. He called to his attacker as if they were a person, but his skepticism was still evident. Give yourself up, and you'll get treated right. He yelled. An awful bluff. I caught him. Right here. I heard him say, which instantly changed his attitude. God is good. They're going to pay for this, he threatened, grinning as he bolted toward my voice. However, that wasn't something I said. Before I had a chance to stop him, I heard him leap into a nearby bush and scream in agony. It echoed around to keep me from entering the scene to offer assistance. It quickly vanished farther into the wooded area, away from where I was. I then got to my feet. I sighed and began working while stretching my sore limbs from all the sneaking. I made my way around and set upward all around the main trail, knowing I wouldn't be bothered. I passed by some side roads but didn't take them. Only the main trail was covered by their meager payment. They, therefore, only received the main trail. I came to the trail's edge and was about to turn around when I spotted them. Two recognizable figures with recent red marks on their hands and faces. At the sight of them, my fist clenched. They don't need to make ominous gestures to frighten me because they already know how to approach me. After all these years, they continued to make fun of me with the skins of Regina and Davis. Despite being tattered and barely holding together, I can still recognize them. By the time I was finished, it was dawn. I met the other police officers when I came out of the trail. They appeared exhausted from their extensive night of misadventures, so they were less motivated to challenge me this time. After telling them I was done, I gathered my belongings. They inquired where Austin was, and I replied that he had recently made a sincere remark about returning to meet them pretending to be unaware of everything that occurred. I took advantage of their bewilderment as a cover to elude them and fled back. I let the superiors know that there shouldn't be a problem at that particular trail any longer and that I was available for any additional work they assigned. But I withheld the gory particulars from them. That's the trick to my line of work. The skinwalker is rarely fatally wounded. They really are incredibly difficult to kill. They make it damn near impossible to find their hidden skin, so you have to burn it. Whisper their real name, though this is frequently forgotten in the mists of time. Or, if you prefer, you could defeat them and use silver to kill them. Good luck if you decide to try that. I've been around for a long time because I'm intelligent. I just go about clearing one trail at a time from their hunting grounds. Since I saw it on Saturday night, I have been thinking about this. I'll begin a few months ago, during the winter. I'm from the west coast of Canada. 
The sun had just set, and I believe there was some snow on the ground, so it wasn't quite pitch black yet, but it wasn't light either. We were all in our backyard, my boyfriend, sister, and her boyfriend. I think we only briefly ventured outside to play in the snow because it rarely snows where we live. I realize it's strange coming from Canada. All of a sudden, my sister freezes and claims that she saw something behind a tree. As she approaches it, it vanishes in front of her. It. We all decided to accompany her back inside because she wished to do so. Then sighed. She claimed that she observed a sizable black avian sitting behind a tree and gazing in our general direction. It appeared to be hunched over and sitting with its wings down and covering its body. As she drew nearer, she observed it turn away from her and cover its face with its wings so that it was no longer facing her. As soon as she was close enough to see it, it disappeared from view after advancing farther behind the tree. None of us had any faith in her. We all informed her that it was most likely a herring or a raven, but she was certain that it was a large, wingless creature. She was obviously terrified, but we decided to ignore it. Let's go back to last Saturday. The same people as before were in my bedroom, the master bedroom of the house, including my boyfriend, my sister, and her boyfriend. The sun deck in our backyard can be accessed through these French doors. When my boyfriend opened the door to the sun deck and peered up past our backyard to see this enormous bird leave a branch in a tree, we were about to light some hay. Holy crap, that eagle is huge, he said clearly. Then, just as it was about to disappear behind the line of trees, I saw it break free from the branch and fly for about two seconds. It was undoubtedly larger than an eagle. Not in a tree, though. It wasn't exactly clear because the tree we saw the object fly off was on the dam in our backyard, which leads up to the apartments next to us. But eagles frequently fly over our area. Nevertheless, I've never seen one that big. Its wingspan appeared to be nearly 14 feet long. It was entirely dark. Just missing it, my sister and her boyfriend observed the tree branch from which it had fallen, still bouncing up and down. When I said it resembled a human with wings, my sister quickly freaked out and told us about the time she saw that creature in the backyard. Except for her, we had all forgotten about it until she reminded us. I actually do believe her now. Although he doesn't believe in things like that, my boyfriend claimed it appeared to be a person with wings. In addition to all of this, our dog passed away in January. Juno, rest in peace. I adore you. However, if it was warm enough, she would sleep on the sun deck. We would frequently hear her growling and pacing in the backyard. My dog was uninterested in deer, and raccoons used to come on our back deck frequently and we would hear them, but when she growled like that, it was different. It might have been a deer or a raccoon in the backyard. I'd like to give some background on why I'm writing this before I start my story. I don't believe in any kind of cryptid or skinwalker. However, I'm absolutely enthralled by the topic. It took place in a tiny town called Albert, Colorado, which is located extremely secludedly in the middle of nowhere, like a trip to the grocery store. A 45-minute drive was required just to reach a store. When I was 11 years old, I moved there during the summer of 2013. My family had a home on the edge of an eight-acre plot of land surrounded by a reasonably dense pine forest. The main street, which had to be a little under an eighth of a mile away from the house, was reached by a very poor, long dirt road that served as the driveway to the home. I still believe that location to be the calmest I've ever experienced. We could not hear the rare corn that would pass by 
so the only sounds we could hear were those of nature and our chickens. The nights there were the best thing about the place, but because there was no city light, I could see every star in the night sky, no matter how faint. However, the darkness prevents you from seeing anything below the night sky's horizon. Additionally, there were several packs of coyotes that resided there. Every night, these packs would howl at one another. If there were enough of them, the sound would resemble water. The walk we had to take just to take the trash out was the only thing about the property that really bothered us. The garbage company would accept only cans brought to the main road normally. We took the trash out before it got dark. Still, occasionally I would forget, forcing us to do it after dark, which I didn't mind in most cases. We had headlamps ready to see where we were going in the dark, and the trip would be a very calm walk out. Well, there was a night in the summer before I moved out when I neglected to take out the trash during the day, and the headlamp batteries were dead. This required me to make an almost entirely blind descent down our driveway. I went outside and stood for a few minutes next to the trash cans, trying to adjust my eyes by gazing into the night. But as I peered into the gloom, I had the strangest feeling. The typical coyote noises had vanished, and for some reason, my eyes were having trouble adjusting to the darkness. I continued to look into that abyss, hoping to see some indication that my eyes might be adjusting, but to no avail. Then, a terrible sensation ripped through my chest. The best way I can explain it is that it felt like the void I was gazing into was staring back at me. I was paralyzed by fear. Even though I was alone in the area, I felt that I would not be able to return if I walked into the shadows. Before my mother came out to check on me, I stared for a considerable time, almost unable to look away from the darkness. I ran to her and started crying after she opened the door which seemed to shake me out of my reverie. She looked perplexed as she saw that I still hadn't taken out the trash. When I told her how I was feeling, she chuckled a little and offered some supportive advice, saying that if anything was out there, our dogs would have found it by now. She then instructed me to return for ice cream in 10 minutes. I circled back and staggered back to the trash cans. Never before in my life had I felt such fear. What about nothing? I laughed to myself as I realized how ridiculous it was. The chuckle became a cry as soon as I lifted my gaze from the ground. I came to the conclusion that I had no fears. I was afraid that something was waiting outside that I couldn't see for me to leave the house lamp light so that it could attack. My eyes adjusted as the coyotes started up again. All my fear was gone, along with whatever might have been there. I was able to begin dragging the trash cans down after the tears, and the majority of the fear stopped. Although I was able to let the sound of the coyotes distract me, the walk was a little frightening. When I returned to the house, although I felt secure again, I couldn't help but keep returning to that pit. That was probably my scariest experience while we were residing in that house. While there, I had other spooky encounters. The only one resembling the other happened at my friend's house. I'll use his first name, D, for privacy's sake. The only thing separating D's property from mine, about 10 minutes away, was an eroded section of the forest. I got the idea to venture outside at night to look around his property after hanging out and playing many video games that day. He concurred, so we continued to wait until dusk. After playing video games for a few more hours and having dinner, it seemed dark enough to leave. Thus, we did. We were pacing around his seven-acre property while being ridiculously loud and making clumsy attempts to startle each other. We continued doing this for a while before eventually making our way into a clearing, where I believe the attempts to scare each other finally took hold for both of us at once. 
We both turned to look around because we felt uneasy and like someone was watching us. I suggested that we make a scary video to scare the younger geese brother to stay positive and perhaps to distract myself from whatever made us feel this way. Doug agreed while laughing and took out his phone. We started the recording. We continued sightings of objects in the woods. To make the video creepy, I would throw a stick while the camera was turned away, making strange grunting noises. We were both enjoying ourselves. But I knew something was very off, and I believe he felt the same way. Then, suddenly, a twig broke behind us. Dee was looking at me to see if I had thrown it when I glanced at him to confirm what I had assumed he had done. I had worked very hard up until this point to make the video sound as frightened as possible with my voice. But as soon as I heard this, I realized I didn't have to try any longer. We tried to make out something by staring in the direction where the twig had snapped, but to no avail. Once more, I struggled to adjust to the dark because this time, rather than being outside in the light, I was actually inside it. I whispered, partly for the video, partly for my sanity. Run. Dee's face was illuminated by his phone as he nodded. After that, we immediately began running toward his home. There was a feeling in my gut that we weren't fast enough and needed to hide, and I don't think I had ever run so hard in my life before. Dee must have experienced the same. He took the initiative and led the way to a nearby shad catch. As we passed, a motion sensor light turned on, so we hurriedly entered the shed. He closed the door and lit up the shed's interior with his light. I thought at the time that the cats were also avoiding something. Looking back, they were probably simply resting in their beds in a shed corner. This made me feel even more uneasy. He then began scaling the shed's wall before escorting us to a shelf-like structure with a window so we could see outside. These occupied one side of the window while I occupied the other. We were standing face to face, and the window gave us a view of both angles. We eventually began to relax and refocus on the video due to the outside light and the added comfort of a roof over our heads. The motion sensor light turned off as we discussed the possibility of once being outside, returning the area to darkness. As the uneasy feeling returned, we fell silent. I had the impression that we were being sought out rather than watched any longer. We searched the outside of the window carefully for any signs of anything. I was having a thought when I heard footsteps. I wasn't sure what I was hearing because a wall separated us from the stairs, which muffled their sound. When I questioned it, he confirmed that he had also heard them. But I'm fairly certain that he said that for the video. We resumed our silence as we listened. The footsteps then became a little louder. We were distracted when one of the cats began rubbing against us, so we turned around and petted him. Who wouldn't medicate, after all? The outdoor motion sensor light turned on as we were grooming him. Goosebumps began to spread from my face to my arms. We slowly swung around and peered out the window, but nothing was there. We ought to go inside, he advised, and I concurred. After returning the cat to its bed, we prepared to sprint fifty yards to his house. I closed the door after he had opened it. Then we found ourselves running as quickly as possible through the chilly, dark woods away from whatever turned on that light. We finally arrived at this front door after an endless sprint and hurried inside. We slammed his sliding glass door and didn't go to bed until the sun came up the following morning. Even though these encounters were terrifying at the time, a lot of it can be explained simply by the fact that I was freaking out. During the trash can story in Eddie's house, nothing was outside. The following morning, outside the catch, shed, we discovered raccoon prints. All of these things never prevented me from loving what I was doing, and after a week, 
I realized I was probably just making things up. And throughout the following year that we lived there, we kept appreciating the woods. But ultimately, my family and I decided to leave. My dad received a job offer in Minnesota that would help our financial situation and free him up from the daily two-hour commute. However, Minnesota turned out to be the worst place I've ever lived, at least for the first couple of years. It was very difficult for me to make friends in Minnesota after spending so much time in a small town and getting used to my friends in Albert. I refused to go to work to make friends, and the students at my new school did not seem to particularly like me. I was constantly thinking about my friends and the girlfriend I had left in Albert. The only thing that seemed to make me at least somewhat content while there was talking to my friends from Albert almost every night and playing video games and other things with them. My parents permitted me to visit my family in Albert over the summer despite my poor mental health, the garbage, and the lack of friends I had. My mental health was significantly better after the initial visit. At the new school, I started to be more approachable. As long as I planned the Albert trips, my parents agreed to make them an annual event. Yes, my parents are the coolest people ever. Possibly of all time. I've been going to see my friends in Albert ever since. But I'm writing this because of the most recent visit. I used to hang out with my friends Katie and E, who are the same D as in the previous story, every year. They would hardly ever hang out together due to idiotic adolescent drama. Ironically, squatching, or looking for Bigfoot, usually involves making their fictitious calls and using other communication methods to find one, which was one of my favorite things to do with them. This was just a pretext for me to yell in the woods at night. I finally convinced Kay to hang out together during this most recent visit. We intended to create a short film based on the idiotic videos he and I used to make. We tried to film it, but all we got was one scene before we gave up and just started playing video games. After dinner one day, the group decided to create a video of themselves squatting. After filming one last year, Kay and I decided to do another one this year and try to establish it as an annual event. We started filming the video while taking Kay's younger brother along with us. We didn't intend to be frightened because the sun was still up. All we wanted to do was make a funny, ironic video. When Kay thought we could split up and look for Sasquatch, we wandered around for an hour while shouting for Bigfoot and doing our best Australian accents. Thus, we did. The cameraman followed me as I ventured into the woods, making the occasional squatch call and tree knock. We had a few walkie-talkies with us, so we could communicate with one another while on a call. After a while, DNT and I met and decided to form a group and meet Kay in a clearing. As we started to move, Kay announced over the radio that he was about to make another call. The most frightful sound I'd ever heard as we waited came from the forest. To use my best analogy, it was like a dying elephant with a smoking problem. He then entered via the radio. Were you guys there? He queried. We laughed back because we thought he was making jokes for the video. No, guys. We've enraged the Squatch and we need to leave. Meet us at your home when we return. We quickly exited the forest after that. Kay had apparently cut himself on some barbed wire when we met him, and that, combined with the terrifying scream we overheard, seemed to turn us off. We made the decision to halt for the moment. We went inside and played Halo for hours, teasing each other and acting foolishly in other ways, all the while squatting for the remainder of the night without mentioning what had happened. Around midnight, after the night had passed, we decided to go back outside and perform more squats, but this time without a camera and with a lot of flashlights. To avoid disturbing Kay's family or the neighbors, 
We decided to travel fairly far into the forest before making any calls. We eventually arrived at the spot where we had previously parted ways and then had to decide what to do next. After some discussion, we decided to find Kay's whereabouts. The first squatch call of the night was then made me. The call came, and the woods were dead silent. In my previous tale, I mentioned how the abyss kept watching me. The only difference was that it appeared the forest was paying attention to us. We made fun of one another while discussing it and laughing as we started to move. Kay led us fairly far into his woods before stopping at a small opening and demonstrating that this was the location from which he had radioed us before the call. The problem was that Kay didn't claim the call as being his. He described it as being one of ours. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but now that I think about it, it definitely gives me the creeps. After some more light-hearted banter, Kay drove us to where he had cut himself on the property's boundary. I believe Kay believed we would follow the fence to the spot where he cut himself as we walked in a straight line in the direction of the fence. However, our jokes started to fade as we moved further into the forest. We began to feel the effects of the silence, the darkness, and this emotion. We began to feel as though someone was keeping an eye on us. When we reached the fence and started to move forward, Kay suddenly stopped, perplexed. When I turned to face him, the fence was visible where his flashlight was pointing. But the fence was almost dented if you know what I mean. It appeared as though something had simply stepped on the fence with enough force to prevent it from returning to its normal position. I inquired about it with Kay and then flashed my flashlight into the adjacent building. Although I can't recall everything he told me, I believe he mentioned that it was a sizable portion of Native American land that was once sacred or something along those lines. Take that information with a grain of salt, that was probably horribly incorrect. All of us turned to face one another. Let's discuss it. I can still hear myself saying, in the worst case, we can locate whose property it is and inform him of the broken gate. And given how far out in the country we were, this was obviously not the worst case scenario. But despite that we went on. After passing through some additional, fairly dense woods, we reached a clearing and immediately felt terrible. All of our necks back hair rose at the same time. We started to hear very small twig snaps everywhere. This was a significant departure from the previously peaceful forest we had just been walking through. We quickly searched the area with our lights, looking for anything that might be the source of our apprehension. Dee's light eventually came to a stop. Do you see that, guys? We all focused our lights on the area he was observing. When I couldn't see anything and be about to respond, no, I could make out what appeared to be you. Eyes reflected on a surface. One by one, we each confirmed that we could make out the eyes. Then we made a foolish decision. We moved in its direction. Perhaps there was only one set of eyes in four of us. Or perhaps it was the allure they exuded. With each step we took, they gradually faded away until they were no longer visible. Then, as if pointing in the direction of something that did not like our presence there, we felt the hairs on the back of our neck stand up even more. We felt the presence encircling us as we stood side by side in a square. One of us said, Guys, let's get out of here. We all waited while nodding. When it felt right, we then sped up. When I finally saw the house, we ran as quickly as possible through the forest, jumping over the broken fence. I suddenly stopped when I heard the others running past me, concealed by the forest. My stomach sank. Even though I had just heard the other three people run past me, this was exactly Kay calling for assistance. I forced the idea out of my head that Kay might be involved. After all, I had just heard the three of them pass each other. To catch up with Kay, 
I started running again. After sprinting for a few minutes, I eventually caught up to them, starting to slow down almost at the house. When Kay and I both jerked back, almost falling to the right of us, we were about to start a conversation when I caught up with him. Something just hit the ground, and there was a loud crashing sound. We recovered quickly and pushed the others forward as we ran for the door. We slammed the door behind us as we arrived back at Kay's house and had to sit down, panting. Kay inquired what the hell was going on outside when we all appeared to be calming down. We all circulated, exchanging observations. And he claimed to have seen more than we did in the clearing, including the reflection of eyes. The case claimed to have heard the two thuds that startled us and seen the reflection of eyes in the clearing. He claimed that as we shut the door, he may have noticed the eyes in the clearing and some yellow and red ones. My description of what I saw omitted the voice because I wasn't sure I heard what I thought I heard, and I still don't. As soon as we sat down, we started looking up cryptids and looking for similar stories to our own. Within half an hour, we had settled on the main hypotheses, Goatman, Jersey Devil, or Wendigo. Two very quiet footsteps on the roof were almost in response to our hypotheses. We eventually fell asleep but didn't bring it up again after that. A year or so later, I came across tales of Wendigos while trying to frighten myself. These stories seemed familiar to me, but they weren't quite right, in my opinion. That took him down a rabbit hole, and I eventually discovered skinwalkers. Since then, I've enjoyed reading and hearing tales about them. I'm incredibly curious about who and how they are when they hunt. But after rethinking my story 100 times, I've given up on being rational. 90% of the time, I'm certain that what we heard and saw was just a horse with which we happened to cross paths. However, what really frightens me is when I let the 10% wander and consider that it might have been something strange. In either case, I find it puzzling that Kay continues to reside there. I'll see them again since I'll return to see him this summer. But hopefully, we won't run into anything similar to what we might have the last time. I live in the Yukon, and a wilderness trail is right by my home. Many lakes are accessible via wonderful trails. Every day, I walk my dog on the trails. Because he is part husky and has endless energy, I usually walk him for at least two hours. It's impossible to get him to turn around before an hour. We're going to the trails one day. There doesn't appear to be anyone else nearby. Quieter than usual, it seems. Or perhaps, after ten minutes of walking, we find ourselves on a trail entirely lined with trees. For some reason, my ears are hurting, and it seems like the audio is off everywhere. Also, something seems strange. My dog, who ordinarily barked his head off in terror at any wild animal, was crouched down with his hackles up, completely silent, and just staring up at me with terrified eyes when I looked down. He is dragging me back toward the house as we turn around. He enters my room quickly and takes cover under the bed. He absolutely won't come out. He spent several hours there. When he finally left, he just sat there, his hackles raised, gazing out the window. He objected to staying out all night. He eventually let it go in distress, but he won't take that route even years later. Three months ago, I wrote about hearing drumming while backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest, which I now attribute to actual people playing drums. We visited the same Minister Creek Trail network again this past weekend. We chose a different location and set up camp a few miles north of our previous campsite. We had a quiet evening and went to bed in our individual tents at about 9.30. We were awakened by a loud boom at 2.30 a.m. 
It didn't sound like a gunshot but resembled a black powder cannon going off. We emerged from our tents to talk about what we had all heard as it resounded throughout the valley. Despite how close it was to us, we eventually tried falling asleep again. It was a strange night. The boom had nothing to do with later events. I kept noticing shadows on the tent walls as I lay in my tent, unable to sleep and staring at the ceiling. When I looked, I thought I saw the silhouette of a person moving toward the tent, but it vanished as quickly as it had appeared. I closed my eyes and decide I'm just seeing things. I eventually went to sleep. The next thing I know, a young sounding female voice is waking me up. Papa, Papa. Dad. Unsure if I actually heard this, I jerk awake. I'm lying there now. I glance at my watch, which reads 5.13 a.m. I'm wide awake right now. A short while later, I hear something urgent next to my tent. Dad, Dad, the voice had an odd quality to it. It was simply eerie. Like nothing I've ever felt before, I experienced severe chills. Aside from the fact that my daughter wasn't traveling with us, there were no women in our small group. It's totally dark outside. No flashlights or firelight are visible to me. I set up my tent and tried to make sense of what I'm hearing, imagining that perhaps a camper from another site wandered into our site, believing she was at her dad's tent. I open the tent zipper and turn on my flashlight. A black bear can be seen walking into the woods as I watch it. At that point, I suddenly let out a loud thud waking the rest of my group. The bear didn't seem to care and simply strode into the night. We naturally search the area with our flashlights, but cannot locate anyone else. Everything about it was absolutely crazy. How did I hear that? Do black bears make noises that resemble a young girl pleading with her father? Was a ghost telling me to leave our campsite because a bear was nearby? Perhaps a guardian angel? Or did I experience an auditory hallucination brought on by a sleep disorder at the same time as the black bear prowling through our camp? In any case, my overnight backpacking excursions in the Allegheny National Forest have been rather peculiar. Around 8.30 p.m. yesterday, I went outside to my property's edge of the woods to erect a blind so I could shoot some obnoxious coyotes that have been stealing my chickens. I reside in New Hampshire, close to a place where locals frequently speak of a phenomenon called bad nights. When it gets dark, you don't want to be outside and don't want to be anywhere near a door or window. On the other hand, it always seems eerily quiet on those nights suggesting that animal life is also impacted. Fortunately, it was a good night, so I believed everything would be fine. I prepared a modified long-range handgun, a mounted night vision scope with a thermal setting, and a top-of-the-line handheld night vision device. The cost of both pieces of equipment is in the high four-figure range. I positioned myself in the woods and saw no animals, including coyotes, for most of the night. With my thermal scope, I was scanning the field just before the tree line at around 10.30 when I noticed a red orb emerge. It wasn't moving and was about 4 feet off the ground. The thermal was reading 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which was absurd given that it was only about 40 that evening. The scope is also of extremely high definition. At a distance of 50 yards, I can see small birds shaped exactly like birds. There is no justification for anything to look around. Additionally, it had an odd, staticky appearance that defied explanation, given that it was well within my 50-yard line at the tree line. It vanished as soon as I tried to enter night vision mode. The rest of the night, I saw nothing else quite like it. Finally. Around 11 o'clock, my handheld night vision scope began to malfunction. Without rhyme or reason, the brightness and exposure fluctuated wildly, 
intermittently turning on and off. I stopped using it and put it down to the battery being low or dying. However, when I began to reassemble my equipment this afternoon, it operated as it should. Today's temperature is around 40 degrees, so it is not a temperature-related issue. The last oddity was that the coyotes fled as I was packing up to go inside at midnight after trying in vain to solve my coyote problem, and my gun jammed. A voice can be heard laughing. I couldn't place the source of the echoing noise because I was on a hill and had many trees in the area. I initially believed it to be my neighbor who lives across the field. No, I wasn't firing in the general direction of the house. Just in case anyone asks me about gun safety. 200 feet to my left, behind me, was the house. The neighbor and I were joking about how my hunt went this morning when I said she would know because she laughed. I missed my shot, and she looked perplexed. And I added that I had heard laughter and believed it was coming from her house. She claimed that nobody inside the house was home, alone, awake, or outside at that time. What do you think, everyone? We believe that a forest ghost was tampering with my tools and making fun of me. Or are they just issues with the machinery? I'm going out again tonight, and if anything similar occurs again, I'll try to record it. I was raised in Colorado's beautiful outdoors. My family, who belonged to the nearly middle class, lived in a cottage in Colorado's sparse but chilly wilderness. Dad drove a semi-truck for a living. He hardly ever returned home. My mother looked after me and my older brother Daniel and kept the house in order. There was always something to do where we lived, picking tomatoes and onions from my mother's garden, walking to a friend's house nearby to play PS2 games, or simply fishing with my brother. We didn't have the biggest house or a lot of money, but we did have a good amount of land, albeit mostly cheap and overgrown. There was a small pond on a portion of it, and close to it was an old shed or, I guess, shack, which my dad renovated and used as a fishing shack. There were two tiny cots inside, and the fireplace was small but functional. We frequently went out there and fished with them when my dad had free time at home. As long as we watched out for snapping turtles, which will quickly deplete your pond of fish, the pond was big and there was always plenty of fish to catch. Those little suckers are so greedy. My dad would not be home one weekend, and my brother and I were both bored. We asked my mother if we could go to the shack and spend the night alone. The act of fishing would be very enjoyable. Even though it may not be the tastiest meal, skinning some fish right away after catching it and cooking it over the fire has a nostalgic appeal. Additionally, we could bring a lot home to surprise Dad. He cherished fish. After getting permission from my mother, we gathered our fishing gear and Dad's tackle box and headed for the pond. I was 10 years old, and my older brother was 14. My brother Daniel was a pretty raucous kid who once learned to curse, used it excessively, and thought it made him an adult. That evening, as we walked to the pond, he asked if I spit or swallowed. I didn't understand what he was talking about because I was only 10 years old and didn't realize this was a pointless question. We arrived at the shack after a 20-minute stroll. We sprinted off the trail and toward the pond's edge because there were still a few hours of daylight left. However, we quickly came to an end. We noticed a strange smell as we moved closer to the water's edge. We located it. At least a hundred fish were pulled up to the shore, eaten in half, and then thrown aside. My brother said, snapping turtle angrily as we both immediately scowled. All the dead fish we could find were collected, and we piled them neatly on the edge of the woods, away from the way. However, it didn't really make a difference in the smell. 
We would have to tell my dad if this was a snapper. We didn't know how to set up or use the trap he had for us, and if we did, we were worried that we would lose it in the pond. We looked for it in the water but never noticed anything unusual. We fished for almost two hours, sitting there with our lines in the water, but there was no bite. The problem is that I knew there would still be fish there. Perhaps they were simply being cautious. Scared. Additionally, they required more time to spread. We camped out in the cabin as the night grew chilly following two unfortunate hours without any fish. In the little fireplace, we started a fire. We gathered around it, keeping warm and chatting with one another. At that age, I didn't understand why my brother talked a lot about the girls he was interested in and talked about school. I had never considered my female classmates to be attractive. He looked at me and laughed when I told him I had many female friends. Give it a couple of years, and you'll only be thinking about girls then. I responded, feeling offended for some reason I couldn't put my finger on. He used a finger and a thumb to squeeze my neck and shoulder. I squirmed and tried to get him off me because this tickled so badly before he said, Oh, I get it. Your boy is crazy, then. I pushed him away from me and yelled. I don't have a fear of the dark, at least. He gave me the evil eye. What are you referring to? I don't fear the dark as much as you do. I was about to respond, but I realized I had to share my mother's bed with her the night before after having a nightmare. We reclined and fell silent for a while. I then turned to face him and posed a puzzlement him. Why do people find the dark so terrifying? Daniel gave me a quick glance before returning to the fire. I'm not sure. Since you cannot see what is inside, you must guess. Isn't it frightening when you have no visibility? It would be quite frightening to try closing your eyes and venture into the woods one day, wouldn't it? I blinked. But there's nothing to be afraid of out here, I added. I was a naive but self-assured young child. Daniel retorted, Well, I wouldn't say that. You're only doing it to frighten me. I told him there are no such things as monsters. Like a tiny arrogant. It doesn't necessarily have to be monsters. There are creatures in the world. One of the trail cameras, according to Dad, captured a cougar. The cougars eat humans. I was terrified when I heard this from my older brother when I was only ten. The discussion's direction didn't sit well with me, but I was morbidly curious. The size of them, I queried. As large as my father. Daniel was unable to complete his thought because the cabin was suddenly shaken by a loud noise. Even though it seemed far away, it was very loud. It sounded windy, like a strong wind rushing through a cavern. Although you might be mistaken in thinking it didn't come from an animal, it was a scream of pain. You probably guessed that I jumped out of my skin immediately. Which is that? I pressed Daniel for information. Daniel said, talk about the devil. Such screams are typical of cougars. What are we to do? He looked back at me with a smile after turning to face the shack's door where the sound had been coming from. We won't let it bother us. Cougars are frightened of humans. For a second, I didn't think that was true. He was about to say they could grow to be as big as dad. Something the size of our father. Why would it be afraid of two young children? I didn't understand, and we hadn't brought any significant security. By that time, I had seen a lot of scary movies, and if a big cat resembled the Hollywood monsters I had seen, it might burst through the shack's walls, grab me by the hair, and drag me outside where it would eat me. I'd like to go home. I informed Daniel, he reassured me and put his hands on my shoulders. There won't be any action taken. It won't bother us because it doesn't even know we're here. 
Let's go to bed now. We should probably avoid walking through the woods right now for our safety. I know you are probably considering having me take you back home. Both he and I dozed off in our respective cots. Despite my fears, I was able to fall asleep quickly. I didn't know how long before I woke up. The shack started to tremble. I sat upright and looked over to the cot where Daniel was supposed to be, remembering what we had discussed before going to sleep. He was gone, though. I immediately glanced at the door to make sure it was still closed. Daniel was there. He was turning his back on me. He was about to leave when he flung open the door. Where are you going, Daniel? Worried, I said. But he paid me no mind. He didn't even answer when I called. He exited the shack and shut the door behind him. That previous scream echoed from the nearby woods, not three or four seconds later. My thin blanket was raised to my face. How come he left me? What was his destination? If that cougar caught him, what then? Every few minutes the scream would appear once more. I sat there attempting to get up the entire time. To get my brother, I had to go. I had to stay with him or bring him back. I was too afraid to be by myself. What would happen if he was hurt there? I finally and slowly pulled the blanket over myself and stood up. The fire had reduced to orange glow embers but was still hot enough to heat the shack. A chilly, almost freezing breeze greeted me when I opened the door. Outside, it was very dark. Anywhere the full moon's light didn't reach was total blackness. I walked outside before shutting the door. I then began to move toward the trail while yelling his name. Daniel. Where are you, Daniel? He didn't answer back. I moved toward the trail. The canopy above the trail had numerous openings, letting in most of the moonlight, making it the only forest area that wasn't completely dark. However, it was only half as bright as the pond's edges. I constantly reminded myself that my brother needed me as I walked along the trail because he was out there. If not, I'd rather stop moving or return to the shack. Although I doubt the shaking was caused by the cold, it was cold. More than ever before, I was terrified. The screaming grew louder and more audible as I walked along the trail. It lost some of its windy characters. As I went on, it started to sound more and more animalistic. Only ten minutes from home and halfway through the trail, the screen reappeared, this time clearer than ever. At that point I realized it was coming from the side of the trail to my left. I then made the worst choices. I intended to approach the screaming. You must now comprehend why I took this action. I questioned whether my braver brother, who I thought had come out to see the screaming thing himself. If that were the case, I would find him by following the screams. The other possibility was that the screaming thing had attacked my brother. And once more, turning toward the screams would bring me to my brother, who would require my assistance. I ventured into the shadows of the woods despite being terrified, exhausted, and shivering. My eyes would start to acclimate, though not much. I tried calling Daniel again, even though I knew there would be no answer. I also fell several times. Off the trail, the ground was very unstable and uneven. I could potentially break one of my ankles if I wasn't careful. I soon found myself entering a clearing where the moon's light shone brightly, and I became aware that I was hearing cries. I was now concentrating more on my steps than my surroundings. A terrible sound of someone in agony and torment could be heard crying in front of me. I noticed a human figure crouching when I looked up. They were facing away from me, and I could see their arms moving while their shoulders went up and down. I moved forward. Then I noticed that they appeared vigorously scratching their wrists and arms. 
murmurs then replace the crying cries. Considering or assuming that my brother was hurt. Yes, I yelled at it. Sorry, Daniel. You're fortunate. The mumbling abruptly came to an end. The figure screamed the same scream I had heard all night as it simultaneously angled its head up and sideways toward the sky and me. Both a cougar and my brother were never involved. I run more fervently and quickly than ever before. For some reason, I immediately return to the shack and do not even consider returning home. I suppose that I didn't have a strong sense of space or time at the time. Even though I was halfway there, I thought home would be farther away. I ran and ran until I reached the shack. When I opened the door, my brother sat in his cot and stared at me in confusion. What have you been doing? He gave me a furious look. Had he only just awoken? I said, I thought I saw you leave the shack. What are you referring to? I've been dozing off the entire time. You just made me frightened to death. Don't leave the house without me. Didn't you leave for the trail? In the shadows by himself, his rage changed to worry. However, you weren't present. To find you, I had to go. I started crying. Daniel gave me a hug. I never left you, Carter. I spent the entire time here. I swear. I wouldn't frighten you in that way. And I wouldn't abandon you. After wiping away my tears with his shirt, he stayed up while I went to sleep, and the next morning, he walked home with me while staying close by. We made it back home, but I never really knew what I had witnessed that evening in the woods. I did describe what I saw to my brother, but I told him it was just some crazy guy. I have not believed him. I did experience sleepwalking once back in the day, years earlier. However, it was not like this. He continued to blame sleepwalking for my experience, though. After all, if he had been in his cot the entire time, I couldn't explain why I hadn't noticed him. A few years later, this school resumed its regular academic year, requiring us to wake up early to prepare for class and catch the bus. We had to get up at our house much earlier than other children for school. On our bus route, we were the farthest out. We would get up at 5.30, get ready, and be at the driveway by 6.30 to catch the bus. It was terrible. No matter how early we went to bed, it seemed like we would always wake up feeling worn out. In addition, it was always bitterly cold outside in this area around the start of the school year. It irked me. But fortunately, Mom began a new custom. She would take us in her truck to the driveway's edge and wait there with the heaters on high. And we ate breakfast burritos she usually made for us as snacks. She could make them quickly and easily, and oh my goodness, were they good. I mean, my poor mother? When she applied the parking brake, it didn't last very long. She would snore like a light after a few minutes of waiting for the bus every day, getting the rest I wish I could get more. We actually did that on the first day of class that year. Mom brought a cup of coffee for each of us. Daniel was then a serious coffee enthusiast. I believed I was old enough to drink my coffee black because my mother was an addict, and I was 13 at the time. My mother, however, poured my cup into hers after I took one sip and cringed visibly. She gave me a juice box. I believe it was apple juice because she knew this would happen. After she and I both finished our coffee, mom was the best. Her cup. She did, however, manage to slumber. She began sawing logs. Shortly after, my brother did as well. However, my brother had a good reason for staying up late. He had been talking to a girl on the phone. He would always deny having a girlfriend when we asked him, but I noticed his smile when he picked up the phone. They were sleeping and enjoying the warmth of the heater inside the truck. The sky was still dark and would remain so until about 7. 
There were bushes and dense vegetation on either side of the truck along the driveway. After eating my breakfast, I took up my PSP, which I had received for my previous birthday. I turned it on and briefly played Monster Hunter Freedom, my favorite video game series. I usually listened to it while riding the bus, but since it was a little late and they were both asleep, I was bored. After a while, I started to feel very frustrated. In that mission, Gravius kept killing me. After the third death, which indicated a failure, I turned off the PC and put it back in my backpack while gazing out the window. The entranceway was foggy. Fog is thick all around us. It was starting to warm up slowly but moving very slowly. My nose started to wrinkle up quickly. Whatever it was that I smelled was absolutely horrible. Reeked of rotting dead fish. After assuming it was Daniel, I turned around and elbowed him in the bicep. He hardly noticed it at all. Disgusting Daniel. We're all packed, dude. It's crowded in here and too cold to open a window. He didn't even move. All he did was turn his head to the left, away from me, and carry on sleeping. I rolled my eyes at him while putting my shirt over my nose. The odor was so strong that I was about to throw up again. Despite the smell, I turned my head to the window and peered at the trees to our right. I had the option of sleeping, but I kept my eyes open. We would miss the bus if I dozed off, and my mother would be furious. I was suddenly drawn to something in front of me. There was no wind that morning. The bushes in front of me were the only ones moving though. Something was present outside. I knew it for a fact. Then, coming from those nearby bushes, I heard the same scream I had heard a few years earlier. I went crazy. I experienced chills all over. I tried shaking my mother and brother to wake them up when I turned back to them, but they either ignored me or were that sound asleep. Overall, it was useless to try to wake them up quickly. I turned back to the window to keep an eye on what I was hearing and seeing. After a brief period, a bald, pale head emerged from the bushes, its skin glistening as if it were wet. I observed the head's gradual left and right rotation. The only way I could tell it was turning its head was by the dim moonlight reflection on its swiveling eyes because it turned its head so slowly. I kept asking myself, who is that? Was that the same person from earlier? The image in my head had been fuzzy for years, but this encounter brought it back to the forefront. Unannounced, the four-legged creature in the bushes scurried and crept over to the truck. When this happened, I leaped. Its movements were revolting and horrifying. It was improper. It didn't take a four-legged stroll like a man dressed as an animal. Instead, it scurried like a spider across the ground, searching for insects. It also did so at the rate of a spider. What's unnatural? No, not something a person could do. People are not designed to move in that way. I noticed legs even though this thing resembled a man in shape and appendages. Ahead, I noticed arms. What was it if it wasn't a human? It had moved from the edge of the forest to within such a short distance of the truck that I could no longer see it without rolling down the window or opening the door. And I had no intention of doing that. It continued to slowly crawl around the truck for the following minute as though it were observing it. Or perhaps it was trying to find a way inside. But I made an effort not to consider it. I made an effort to believe that it was unaware of our presence. Knowing that there were animals out there that behaved and looked like this was frightening enough. One who was unafraid of a moving truck. As it moved from my right to my left, to the front, to the back, and finally to the front, where it stopped, I could hear rocks shifting around. I swiveled in my seat and turned to face the back window, hoping to catch a glimpse of something. And I did very soon. 
The creature pulled itself up and crept into the truck bed as long, bony fingers rose above the tailgate and wrapped themselves around it. It's sniffing around in the truck bed, as I can see. Was it searching for a snack? It was the closest it had ever been. I tried to get a clear view of its face, but it proved challenging. It was very still and dark. Its face was flatter than a person's as if its nose had been removed, and that was all I could really make out of it. Then I heard another sound. My mother was beginning to awaken. She correctly sat back down in her seat by yawning and stretching her arms out. She then checked her rearview mirror automatically. I watched her eyes widen before a scream erupted from her mouth and then from her face. I shielded my ears as she screamed. That was loud. A brother of mine spoke truthfully. He had been terrified beyond belief. The creature was also startled by this. But instead of fleeing, it flattened itself so close to the truck's bed that it was hidden by the shadows. Mom was appalled but perplexed. She had only a brief opportunity to see it. When she noticed that I had been observing it, she turned to me and inquired whether it was a dog, cat, or person. Then, as had previously happened, she reasoned that perhaps one of my friends from further away was making their way to the truck to join us. If that were the case, his attempt to scare us was not amusing. My brother, who was now awake, swiveled around in his seat to investigate the commotion. He pressed his face against the chilly surface to see what was behind the glass. However, it was simply impossible to see. We all turned around in response to a sudden squeal from behind us. Finally, the bus was approaching us and squealing to a stop in front of us as its brakes wailed in pain. The truck began to shake at that moment due to a heavy weight or pressure being applied to it from the back. I turned just in time to see the creature flee through the bushes, leaving the three of us speechless. Daniel and I were immediately forced to exit the vehicle and board the bus, which we did quickly. I asked the bus driver if he had noticed that, but he just shook his head and gave me a tired look. My brother still had no idea what we were talking about when I asked if he had seen it in any way. He only knew that his mother had been yelling at something in the rearview mirror. I sighed, sat down, took out my PSP again, and tried to block it. Daniel repeatedly pressed me to explain what it was, but I could not because I was at a loss for words. I believe I had previously witnessed it in the woods. Just saying, right, caused him to finally quiet down. Part 3. Go a few more years in the future. Daniel moved out of the house when he turned 18, but he was 20 when I was 16. He didn't visit as frequently anymore, and I began to miss him. We hadn't gone fishing together in a long time let alone just sat down and chatted about life. Fortunately, Dad could visit the family much more frequently during the same period that Daniel was away. We no longer required nearly as much money as he used to make because he and Mom had finally paid off our affordable house. Dad resisted the idea of working fewer hours. Still, Mom persuaded him that she wanted him to come home, unwind, and assist her in the garden, claimed that it would be therapeutic and even romantic for the two of them. After giving in, he could take half as long as before. He was essentially always at home now. Although I wasn't accustomed to it, I liked it. Heck, I even started assisting them in the garden. Dad was also an excellent fisherman. We would visit the pond, unwind in the shack, and even journey upstate for more adventurous fishing. However, there were also some other unfavorable changes at the time. You see, my only previous sleepwalking incident returned with a vengeance. My parents would frequently find me sitting motionless in the living room, on the couch, in front of the TV. They would come up to me. When I would awaken, 
I would be unaware of my location or how I got there. Even getting out of bed would never cross my mind, which I suppose is typical of sleepwalking. She was concerned that I might hurt her. She and my father talked about getting a one-way lock from my room and blocking my windows to protect me, but I told them they were going too far with this sleepwalking thing. I'd be alright. Getting up and unconsciously sitting on the couch was not a problem. However, things would only get worse. Dad had a heart attack one summer before going to bed, and Mom had to take him to the hospital immediately. She stopped me and told me I needed to look after the house and stay there when I tried to accompany them to the hospital emergency room. I was irate. She made me stay at home because my dad was close to passing away or might be dying. Looking back, I think she was merely trying to protect me. She didn't want to add to my already high level of anxiety. I had a tendency to worry myself to exhaustion. I had developed a greater paranoia over the years. And yes, I believe that my previous experiences contributed in some way. You don't just witness such things and brush them off. I stayed awake that night in my bed while I awaited a call from my mother. Until I was certain that my dad would be okay, I could not do anything, eat, watch TV, or play any games. The thought that I would never see my dad again appalled me. He sacrificed his entire life to make sure we could afford this modest home. But just as we were beginning to socialize and he had some free time, he suffered a heart attack. Life was unfair. Even if they called to tell me he was fine, dad would still have to slow down. Even if we could, would we be able to fish again? Perhaps I was overanalyzing it. Within an hour, my mother did, in fact, call. She assured me that my father would be fine. Although the surgery wouldn't be necessary, they sent him home with a prescription. He would have to drastically alter his diet and exercise routine. I grinned, simply grateful that he was unharmed. I could finally flip over in the bed after that and close my eyes for a while. The next morning, they would return home. In the middle of the night, I woke up. I rubbed my throbbing head and considered getting up to get some ibuprofen. I lowered my hand, but I quickly raised it again. It hurt. When I turned around, a stick was poking into it. I then took a look around. I had left my home earlier. I was in the heart of a forest. I was outdoors. My heart sank. I'm not sure how I got here. Did I come here while asleep? I had never advanced to this point before. I stood back up and began scanning the area for a landmark. Any of the above. I didn't though. How do I return to my home? I was lost. I was starting to worry. I dug through my pockets. I had been wearing my shorts when I passed out. You see, if I wore running shorts or other types of sports shorts during the day, I would typically nod off. They were cozy and warm. Fortunately, I still had my phone in my pocket. I called my brother in fear. I wasn't sure why I called him instead of my parents, mom or dad, to make the call. Perhaps I didn't want to scare mom because she had just experienced the trauma of her father's heart attack. I also genuinely miss Daniel. It was 4 a.m. on my phone. I hoped Daniel would be awake when I called his number. Hey Court, how are you? He responded, sounding worn out and agitated. Daniel. Daniel. Man, I've been sleepwalking a lot, and I don't know how I got out here, but I woke up in the middle of the woods. I have no idea where I am. After that, he sounded more alert and concerned. I'm fine, I'm fine. Please calm down. I'll be at the house soon. I'll bring the most powerful flashlight I can. I'll be coming to look for you. Just remain there and call your mother. 
No, her father is in the hospital, as well. What took place? Yes, sir. I'm good. Yes, she is fine, father. He had a heart attack, but he's doing fine, right? Just come find me, please. I'm headed your way now. Just be cautious, and call the forest service if you start to worry that you might be too far from home. Call someone who could use a GPS or something to locate someone for you. You have my love, man. We terminated the call. I sat down on the ground in the woods. I attempted to get my phone's GPS to function. I had reception, but no matter how hard Google Maps tried to load my location, it simply wouldn't update. I'm not entirely sure what happened. My dot would load, but I couldn't tell where I was from the map, and even when I moved around, I couldn't get my dot to move. Just to be sure, I stayed in the same location. I tried to keep in mind what I had always been told. Should I stay put if I got lost in the woods, or should I get up and look around for civilization or other people? Do I shout, or do I keep quiet? I was left to do nothing but wait. I repeatedly reminded myself. Daniel was en route. He promised to arrive shortly. He would shout once he arrived here. He would be circling with a powerful torch. I would definitely see him if I didn't hear him. That evening, the woods were eerily quiet. It made me nervous. Every move I made echoed for what seemed like an eternity. No bugs were chirping, and although it was dark and a little warmer than usual, I never heard the sound of animals moving about at night in the underbrush. Of course, I couldn't help but think back to when I first encountered that thing. Stepping into the woods, observing the shape tearing at itself, and then hearing the murmur. As if by design. Once more, I heard a murmuring that seemed to be coming from all directions. It was the same voice I previously heard, but it was speaking differently this time. Around here. Sorry. Instead of fleeing, I lay back down on the ground, thinking that would be sufficient cover. However, as the murmuring grew louder and closer, I became too terrified to keep my eyes open. I shut my eyes. Call me ignorant if you must. I should have sprinted. I ought to have moved or taken a different action. I didn't though. I was lying there with my eyes closed when I felt something close to my skin on my scalp. I was just considering covering myself with objects from the ground, like leaves and twigs, to blend in. Something was sniffing me and murmuring something that had just been finished. My neck down to my head was covered in the smell. My eyes started to get teary. I wanted to scream and cry, but at this point, there was nothing I could do but lay here and hope for the best or lash out in self-defense if this thing retaliated. As the air continued to sniff, I felt it blowing past me. Then, as whatever it was started to drool on me, I felt warm and wet. It began drooling at the smell of me. It then started to cry, just millimeters away from my neck, and the murmurs returned. Please accept my apology. I really did try. I kept noticing drops of water falling on me. These, however, were unique. These were colder and smaller tears. Whoever or whatever this was, I really did think they were sorry. A sound that was more heavenly than any other before or after it interrupted my current state of clenching my teeth and forcing myself to bite down on nothing. Carter, my sibling, showed up. He was trying to find me. I only need to follow his voice and locate his light's beam. This creature choked up briefly and fled, scurrying before screaming again at the same time as my brother's call. I awoke and opened my eyes after the noises stopped. I got to my feet and yelled, Daniel. I asked him to keep calling my name so I could be certain of his location as I ran in the direction of his voice when he called back. 
I suddenly emerged from the tree line and found myself in the backyard of our house. Daniel came running up to me, shining a torch up my feet and giving me a bear hug. I thank God that you are okay, dude, he said, tightening his squeeze. I was freaking out about you. I was unable to speak for some reason. Not correctly. I was still in tears. When I did attempt to speak, the only words that came out agonized ramblings because my stomach felt weak and tight. We entered the kitchen together after he assisted me outside. He tried to strike up a conversation while brewing coffee. He informed me that he had proposed to his girlfriend but that we had to keep it between us because he wasn't ready to tell his parents. He began by talking about his time in college, including how many friends he had made and how things were going, before attempting to inquire about my life. But I was unable to speak. Still unable to speak. It appeared that I had lost my sanity for the rest of the night until I could fall asleep again only after I woke up. My parents had returned home just before Daniel left to return to his apartment. I expressed my gratitude to him. I told him right as he was getting into his car. The object from the bus stop was there again when I looked outside. The creature from the nearby woods. It was there again. He fixed his gaze on me. He nodded after forcing a hard swallow as if they had begun to believe me. Daniel left in a car. I then returned inside with my parents. I hugged them both and grinned, feeling relieved that they were okay. We were all fine. to provide some context and background information for this entire encounter. I was about 15 years old when it happened. With my family and some of my extended family, including my aunt, uncle, and cousins, I was setting up camp in the middle of nowhere. You can probably understand how it felt to have no one else to do the stupid things I did back then since I was the oldest child present in the RV. It was almost like Nirvana when I arrived at the campground and met other teenagers because there was a good two-year gap between the inferiors and me. All of these were people we knew fairly well from previous camping trips, so it was expected that we would get along with them right away and seem like old friends after only an hour. Here's the story. My parents had great faith in me. The truth. I enjoyed my time out but I also value returning home in time for dinner. They didn't worry much when I spent most of the day away from them with other campers. The only requirement was returning to the RV before 8.30 p.m. for dinner. Imagine a group of 6 15 to 16 year olds wandering around in the woods for most of the day without adult supervision. That alone is a formula for achievement. However, on this particular day, we discovered a cute little deer trail that we had not discovered in the two years that we had previously visited. It didn't seem much like a deer trail, after all. A particularly dense section of the underbrush was traversed by it. There might be a foot of open space, three and a half feet away from upward pointing branches. It's difficult to find something in the brush unless you're looking for it or know exactly where it is. A broken branch outside the entrance served as a marker, and it was quickly explored and forgotten. However, I recalled this unique little tunnel. One of the adults suggested that we play manhunt in the woods at night, while we all had dinner. Even though not everyone agreed with this concept entirely, their objections were squashed like fall leaves in the overall scheme of things. Everyone received a flashlight and a team assignment was made. Here is an explanation of Manhunt for those of you who are unclear. Each participant in the game receives a flashlight, and they are split into two groups. There is a catch, though. It's basically just a glorified flashlight tag. You must correctly identify each person as you capture them so that, if possible, 
they can cooperate with the hunters. The winner is given a candy bar or something similar remaining. Whatever is provided. In any case, this is how we handled it. I am grouped with the runners in the first round because we are essentially being pursued by the hunters. We are given five minutes to escape the hunters by running, climbing a tree, or doing whatever we want. I usually sit on top of the tree, but that position has never yielded the best results. Therefore, I decided to play the cat and employ one sure fire escape strategy to finally win something. The unkempt little path through the thicket served as the hiding place. Because it was so carefully concealed and out of the way, it took most of the head start time to find the damn thing. I went by hiding places, siblings were questioning my actions, and I could hear them whispering softly to one another, like a bird fluffing its wings. I'd like to point out that I have bad hearing. My ears are probably my best tool in this game. But just as I arrive at my destination, I hear the air horn's brief blast, signaling that the five minutes are up. I swim around and enter this tiny ground path. Until I'm about halfway in, I shuffle on my hands and knees and squat like some enormous, deformed quail. The hunters are performing an initial sweep through the trails in search of blatant hiders, and individuals caught trying to switch locations. When they finally came upon me, they immediately turned around and fled. I make an effort to correct myself as I move down the tunnel. I honestly have no idea how it happened. Still, I accidentally dragged my stupid body down the rabbit hole after discovering an even more obscure path inside that one. But this one had a slight hollow at the end rather than a dead end. I'm not going to go into detail about what I discovered there. I'm sorry, but I'm powerless to. A younger looking woman was curled up in the fetal position, covered in stab and cut wounds. Her hazy, glassy eyes appeared to be staring straight through me. I won't elaborate any further. I froze there as dark burgundy stains appeared on my jeans because I was terrified to scream. I became frozen and assumed a pseudo-catatonic state, like a marble carving. It seemed like hours. Later, I heard someone else walking down that same path. Have you ever experienced such extreme fear that you genuinely thought about doing something incredibly stupid to escape for just one crazy moment? One of those occasions occurred when I let out a brief, trembling whimper before getting up and moving. Anyone on the path stopped eagerly, started moving again, and then resumed. A man's panting and irregular breathing could be heard, which was a terrible indicator of whoever it was and was approaching me by the second. By some wonderful, lovely miracle, he failed to see the path that led to Brushy Hollow. He was dragging something bulky and awkward as he passed the entrance, and I heard him. There were clinking sounds and occasional attempts to silence the brief, sharp noises. Near the end of the tunnel, I overheard a low curse, and I shot out of the tunnel through the underbrush like a bullet bursting through a barrel. As I heard the man suddenly take a breath and start moving towards me, there were loud cracks, crashes, and annoying rustling around me. I was taking too long to leave as the horse's deep panning got closer and closer to me. I managed to burst through the door, stand up while still half asleep, and start moving down the trail. The unidentified pursuer followed me closely for a while. Still, he appeared worn out to continue pursuing me at the same speed. In all honesty, I'm surprised I didn't trip even though everyone loves to point out that people always do in horror movies. Making my jello like unsteady walking appendages work to get me away from whoever was behind me was like trying to run on water as my adrenaline raced through me at Usain Bolt's speed. After what seemed like an eternity, I finally arrived at the main trail leading back to the camp and ran down it while yelling bloody murder. From the trees, confused faces peered out, and I believe I heard someone calling after me. It was simple to get to the camp, 
but more difficult was trying to explain why I woke up half the camp and fled out of the woods so quickly. When I finally choked out the words to explain, speed was more difficult. The group of adults waiting at the trailhead went into a profound, menacing silence, and I recall it. From then on, I can't say that I remember much. I am aware that the police were called, and my mother and aunt ran hysterically along the trail, pleading with the other children to return to safety. You don't ignore someone yelling at you like that. They rounded everyone up in less than 30 seconds and were charging back toward the camp. A man carrying a knife was discovered by the police creeping along a trail in the woods. On the trail, a saw and numerous sharp objects were discovered in a black garbage bag. Some had dried blood speckles and spears. In my opinion, there isn't any way to move past it. I occasionally still have nightmares of being chased by a man breathing heavily down the back of my neck to catch me. And occasionally, he succeeds in those nightmares. I recently went to Yellowstone National Park, so yesterday, we took our boat out on Yellowstone Lake. We wanted to end our trip on a high note, since it was our last day. Wisconsin fishermen were catching trout, cutting them up, and then tossing them back into the lake as we were preparing to launch our boat. To manage the fisheries, the government has a job, also known as an angular incentive program. By speaking with them and observing their rhythmic work, one could tell how knowledgeable these men were about the lakes and how much experience they had, as they likely did for many years. The older, bigger guys were kind enough to assist us in getting our boat and because, in general, they knew their stuff. We've never used this boat before. The guys warn us to exercise caution. A fisherman tells my dad about the bodies still missing in the lake that were never recovered, including a couple park rangers, as the water has large swells and the wind is picking up. The anglers explain that because the water is too cold, hypothermia develops after 20 minutes. He warns us once more, but we still go. We didn't get very far before three to five foot waves pushed us back in. The angler assisted us in guiding the boat back onto the dock and onto the boat trailer, almost as if he had anticipated our quick return. I'm glad you're back, he said with a simple smile. There is bad weather outside. In order for you to understand why I'm so intrigued by the bodies of these missing people in the lake and the park rangers' bodies that are all thought to be at the bottom of Yellowstone Lake, I thought I had to give you some background information. I am unable to locate any information regarding these missing people or missing rangers, though. I checked the National Park website and spoke with other park employees. Nothing. What do you believe? Does anyone with information on missing individuals or park rangers at Yellowstone Lake? My mother experienced this a few months ago in a remote area of Montana. My mother took her dog outside to relieve herself in the middle of the night. She had a sizable yard where she let her dog run loose while she waited for it. My mother reported hearing an odd whistling. If not for the fact that whatever it was didn't appear to need to breathe, she would have assumed it was a human. The noises never stopped. She described it as consisting of all the possible dog whistles at once. She was certain that something was trying to entice her dog into the wilderness. Fortunately, the dog didn't notice the noise and returned to her after going potty. My mom and stepdad had been rock hunting a few days prior when they noticed what appeared to be two-footed dog tracks crossing the road with an eight-foot stride. She speculates that a dog man the cryptic dog that stands upright on two feet may have been responsible for the entire incident. She had a Bigfoot encounter when she was young. She fears cryptids and believes in their existence as a result. She refused to let me walk the dog after dark when I visited her this summer, and she wouldn't do it either. 
She pleaded with me sympathetically and urgently to promise not to leave the house after dark. Over the summer, I personally witnessed several odd occurrences at her house. She is still looking for similar experiences and stories to shed light on what might have happened to her, but she hasn't come across any. Please share if you or someone you know has ever heard whistling like that. I'd be happy to share more information with anyone interested. Unfortunately, my stepdad passed away while I was there, so I'm moving her back to the East Coast with me. We're about to enter the hotel lobby to purchase breakfast. I might not be able to share more for a few days, and I might take a while to reply. So here is a paranormal story that is less rural and more focused on country roads. Every summer, my family and a few of my closest friends would drive up from Southern California to Bridgeport, a town in the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains near the California-Nevada border. It is a really cool area if you have ever been. Reno to Tahoe Big Bike Route excellent hiking and camping in the high country of Yosemite. Abounding in wildlife. Bodie Ghost Town, which is nearby, has a crazy old history involving native tribes and the Midwest's gold rush. Still, my favorite part is the world-class trout fishing. I thought it was cool that Mark Twain had once visited and stayed in the town in the distant past. The town is small, with 20 buildings to match the feel of Main Street, USA. It is surrounded by rivers, lush meadows with horse and cattle ranches, and stunning wooded snow-capped mountains. We frequently camp near Twin Lakes, about 10 miles outside of town but we always made it a point to get into town in time for dinner at this bar. A minimum of once during the trip, stop at Rhino's for pizza and beer. We performed this one evening, and at dusk, we returned to camp. Just enough light was present to distinguish the peaks on the horizon. However, it was still intensely dark, with many billions of stars visible. The road back to the camping area zigzags through the ranch land's square-cut properties. It has two narrow lanes, barbed wire along the edges, an irrigation channel, and few streetlights. There is only one installed by the dude ranch that comes to mind. So we return to camp by car. Due to the darkness and the need to watch out for deer, we had to use our brights. My mother asks us, did you see that kid in the swimsuit on the side of the road? As soon as we arrive at camp. I'm perplexed and mildly amused by the concept, and I ask, Where was this? He was walking shirtless along the side of the road near the cows. I had been following her and my father in the car. If someone had been present, there is no way I could have overlooked this. No one in our car noticed him. According to my dad, he didn't either when she first noticed him, though not shocking to my father. On the other hand, my mother reports a paranormal sighting is not surprising. It always appeared to be after her. She was completely serious. Even described the short's color according to his hairdo. She couldn't see his face because he was walking in the same direction as us, but he had to be in his twenties. Therefore, we half-jokingly assumed that it might have been a ghost. Even in the summer, the Sierra Nevada mountains are high enough elevation. They have crazy enough weather to easily kill someone who hasn't dressed for the cold of the night. It was also dark and late. Nobody had seen him, particularly in swim trunks and a shirtless. She was in the middle of nowhere, on a clear August night. I woke up with the temperature in the teens. It takes about 20 minutes to drive it in these fields at a reasonable speed, never mind walking in the dark to camp, but I suppose anything is possible. When we woke up the following morning, we discovered that my foolish friend had left the cooler outside after the rest of us had gone to bed, which allowed a bear to feast on us. So we decided to make the most of it by returning to town for supplies, additional fishing locations, and dinner. 
I was returning to camp at the time. I was zipping and zagging through the fields in front of my parents when suddenly I felt a bright set of headlights on my behind. Looking back, I could see that this had to be a lifted truck of some kind, possibly a Bronco or something similar. Rearing up on my SUV so closely, I worried we would be hit. I initially tried to accelerate a little, but the car followed me closely. I'm getting annoyed and worried now. There was no real place to pull over without running the risk of pulling into a ditch and becoming stuck since this was a two-lane road at night, making it easy and safe for anyone to pass. I keep going faster, but I'm beginning to worry because I know the hills are approaching and there are a ton of deer in this area. But the lights on this car keep flashing. As my wife and friends consider the primitive asshole who is pulling this, they begin to feel a little freaked out as well. And so it goes through the fields until I reach the last turn before it enters the woods. At this point, I suddenly felt extremely uneasy inside and almost as if someone were screaming in my head. Slow the fuck down, so do or die. I start slamming on the brakes, fully anticipating that this truck will ram us as I do so. As we turn the corner, a group of about six deer can be seen standing in the middle of the road. I was a little startled right away. Seeing animals while driving in the dark is always a little unsettling, particularly large ones. I then realized that I was not blind anymore and that we most definitely weren't hit. The lights are gone when I turn to face myself in the mirror. Just left. There is no dirt from a car pulling off the road in the rear brake lights. There was no yelling in the other lane, no road for them to even have turned off, and no headlights illuminating the nearby trees. Then I see my parents approaching from behind us in their car. We're all perplexed, trying to work out where this person went. We continued the drive to camp after the deer move out of the way. Immediately after the incident, adrenaline makes me a little irritated, so I start ranting about how stupid the man was, how he could have died, blah blah blah, making everyone feel truly good. My mother immediately starts giving me the standard parent talk as soon as we exit the vehicles. But what aggravates me, even more is when she calls me a fool for taking off in the dark on such a hazardous road. And how fortunate I am that I didn't accidentally kill us all with those deer, how I needed to be more cautious, etc. I responded, well, it wouldn't have been such a problem if that dickhead wasn't riding my ass. What are you referring to? She answers, nobody was following you. The cards have all been turned. Fortunately, my wife and friends had gone through everything with me. As they began to discuss the truck, I began to explain how. When I had had enough, I listened to my instincts and reason and decided to slow down just as we approached the deer and noticed that the truck had just vanished. My mother was startled by it, apologized, and cautioned me to use caution in the future before beginning to laugh and remark on how peculiar the trip had been. I'll give my mother this. She never referred to us as crazy for what we had gone through in life, which is something I believe many parents forget to do for their children. It's funny because every time I heard tales of ghost trucks or similar experiences from small towns in the East, I thought about how ridiculous they sounded. But now that I've used it, oh my god, it's hazardous. Clearly dangerous never would I wish that upon anyone. We've never had any problems on this road, but I will admit that I drive much more cautiously now. I've always wondered if the truck and the shirtless man were somehow related, but I've never discovered anything. I guess only God knows. Although I was raised in Orange County, California, some truly wild areas were nearby. And after high school, we visited the Cleveland National Forest and Black Star Canyon, a large, heavily forested area, including Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, 
stretches from Orange County to San Diego and nearly to the border. Anyway, when we were kids, we were told it was haunted. True story, it seems. There was a tribe up there that was massacred by hired fur trappers in the early 1800s because they kept stealing horses from Mexican ranchers to use as meat. Enough said about some stupid high school students. So, we decide to hike here at night. My friends and I frequently engaged in activities like this, but I consider myself fairly skeptical. Fortunately, the majority of us exhibited reasonable judgment. We were all alert and in agreement to turn around at any given sign because this area is also well known for its mountain land population. Even if only one of us desires it. The way the trail operates is that you park at a forestry gate and begin walking down a long, narrow asphalt road that is mostly made of dirt from the time when there were few houses in the 1950s and 1960s before the floods washed them out and the land was given to NFS, turning into a complete hiking trail eventually. There is a barbed wire fence and numerous signs advising people not to cross this road. As a result, we are walking down a road after midnight in complete darkness without using our flashlights to add to the flare. Well, as we continue to travel further and further down this road, which, mind you, is brand new, we will. I frequently notice a man leaning against a wooden fence post holding the barbed wire, just sort of leaning on it while clearly focusing on us. I'm referring to a full-on cowba hat with a brim, simply swaying. But it's only a silhouette that I can see out of the corner of my eye, and every time I turn to face it, I can't see anything. To remain composed, I tell myself this is illogical and dismiss it as an optical illusion. But despite seeing this guy every ten or so posts, I keep quiet around the other guys. Finally. We reach a point after more than an hour of walking when we discuss turning around due to the passing of time. My friend says yes just then, and I keep seeing what I think is a cowboy along the fence. Not even shit. I experienced a drop in my stomach. I found it hard to believe. These were simple wooden fence posts mostly surrounded by fields, typically four feet tall. No way does that resemble a person. We all decide to turn around after I also talk about it. My other friend starts freaking out, ripping off his shirt and screaming about getting stung. All of us are perplexed and staring at him like he's crazy, but he insists that a bee or other insect stung him. We, therefore, shine our lights on his back to see. As we do, three distinct scratches begin to form extending from one shoulder to the opposing hip and even oozing blood. Needless to say, we were finished after that, but we returned without further incident to the car. You could probably counter that the shadow was just a coincidence caused by the darkness and the shapes fooling our eyes. I'll give it to you. However, at the scratch in such a way that we witnessed it happen while talking about the idiot ghost cowba and in a way that neither he nor any of us in the circle around him could do. Okay, something is happening. The Haunted Highway and the Jack Osborne Show pilot episode ended up using this location. I've been back since, but only during the day, and it's pretty cool. California is more diverse than you might think. There are a lot of stories I've heard, and this is just one of them. In the year 2020, I had been dating my boyfriend for almost a month at this point. It was near Halloween in late October. My aunt told me about this interesting unmarked grave in a nature park near Lake Erie when I told her I wanted to go for a fun, late night nature stroll. We went there, got completely disoriented, and neither of us had reception, but we still had a great time. We avoided getting lost by staying on the trail. We lost enough for it to be the spooky fun we were looking for, even though we could find our way back to the parking lot. 
after finding the grave, taking photos and videos, and taking a brief break, we noticed that the lake was only a few yards away, even though we were on top of the cliff. To find a trailing spot that led us to a little solitude, we decided to follow the trails farther along the lake. It was October, so it was already very dark and partly cloudy when beach time came around at 9 p.m. We sat on a log, though, and just stared out at the lake as a few faint stars lit it up in a lovely way. We both noticed this flash of light that came from behind us after about 15 minutes of just sitting, gazing, and unwinding. In contrast to most similar stories, I should point out that there was no use of drugs or alcohol. But as soon as we both noticed the flash, we both stopped turn to face one another and inquire whether we both noticed it. To see where it was coming from, we turned on our flashlights and turned around. Although there was no one around and it had been about two hours since we arrived, we had not noticed or heard any other people outside. It appeared to be a very bright camera flash. Even after searching the area, we could not locate any trail cameras. So, to return to the car, we picked up big sticks from the beach and started moving down the trail. Since the route we took was much faster than the one we took to get there, it was probably a good decision on our part that we didn't take the same trail back. However, we kept spotting eyes in the nearby woods all along the way back. Even though we knew they were just the deer, coyotes, and other animals that lived there, it still freaked us out and kept us on our toes. We returned safely to the car and made it home without incident. However, a few days later, we returned during the day and searched the area for any trail cameras that the darkness may have prevented us from seeing. We found nothing, and we're still puzzled about what that flash was. Although it was quite unsettling, we had a great time that evening. If anyone has any ideas as to what it might have been, please share. My aunt told me this tale many years ago. In West Virginia's Lincoln County, my aunt and her family resided in a secluded, rural area. She claimed that her father occasionally went fox hunting. He would trek up the mountains with the other men to their camp. They would spend the evening there talking and exchanging stories while letting their dogs chase foxes. Mayan had a large family, which was not unusual in the 1950s. Wilderness in West Virginia. Mayan's mother decided to hike up to her husband's, Mayan's father's, camp with a few younger kids. Mayan was a member of the group. According to her, they spent several hours unwinding and spending time with their father after making the long trek back up the mountain. The group was having so much fun that they were unaware of how late it was. My aunt's father gave his wife a lantern for his wife and their children to see on the arduous trip back down the mountain. The light from the fox hunter's camp eventually vanished as the group departed. Her mother observed a small ball of light about the size of a softball, coming down the mountain behind them as they continued to move forward. She and the kids stopped on the trail to wait, assuming her husband needed something. They watched as the light gradually moved down the path and into a better view. Mayan claimed that as they got closer, they could see a ball of light floating about three feet above the ground rather than a lantern. She claimed that as soon as her mother realized this, she positioned the kids in front of her and instructed them to sprint down the mountain's old trail. According to my aunt, they all reportedly ran as quickly as they could down the hill. She claimed that the ball of light moved more quickly the faster they ran. When they eventually arrived at their house, according to my aunt, they hurried inside and locked the door. My aunt said they were all terrified. Once they had the nerve to look out the window, they discovered nothing. In September or November of 2020, my husband and his sister went hiking. They were hiking Sharp Top in southwest Virginia when this incident occurred. 
They hiked the entire trail without incident, but as they returned to their car, they were returning down the trail. They spotted a black, opaque figure at the trail's base, close to the road. They could only make out white where a face would have been at the top of this amorphous figure, but no other details. They claimed it glided across the road and into the tree line and was about five or six feet tall. As soon as it reached the tree line, it silently vanished. Bear in mind that it fell, so there were leaves everywhere. Since the trees were bare, they would have heard and seen something, but they heard nothing. He estimated that they were about 40 yards from it, but there was still enough light outside for them to clearly see what was going on. My husband had never before encountered anything paranormal, but my sister-in-law had in the past, albeit not to the same degree. I'm curious if anyone has heard of any accounts of this black figure with a white face similar to the ones we haven't found in Appalachia. Although we are familiar with most local folklore, my husband hasn't yet connected with any of it. Since it was such a brief period and I didn't see anything, I debated whether or not to talk about it. Still, in the end, I decided that perhaps I could discover the causes of this noise. My 28-year-old husband and I reside in a small community adjacent to the vast redwood forest. The distance to the mysterious trees is only about 15 minutes. For some reason, a street was constructed in the middle of the forest where we live. On either end of our street, two sizable patches of forest are about 5 to 15 miles apart, one of which has a small bridge that leads to a much larger forest. We also like to stay up and wake up late, so I'll add that we tend to be night owls. I sat under the covers to get to what happened while my husband got ready for bed. After a hot day, it was a pleasant, cool autumn night. I opened the window to enjoy the wonderful fall air on my face while curling up under my five blankets. Not yet asleep, I started to look up the upcoming full moon while lying on my phone. Simply put, I enjoy that kind of stuff. Since our street is an old street without street lights, I was surprised to discover that the moon was at 100% tonight. From my bedside, I looked out my window to confirm that the light on the ground outside was very well lit in a bluish moon-toned collar. I thought, oh neat, and then I sat back on my phone. I like to put off going to sleep until my husband gets into bed. I'm not sure if it's a comfort issue, but I typically can't sleep well in bed unless he's close by. I had been sitting there, wide awake, listening to the crickets outside for about two to five minutes when I heard a man scream up my street. It appeared to be coming from two to three doors down close to one of the forest's edges. At first, I thought it was just a frightening scream, but as it went on, I realized it was actually just a silly guy making a fake scream. Even though it was 2 a.m., the scream continued for far too long before changing into a deep gurgling roar at the very end. Similar to how I never know when someone in a movie transforms into something. However, the first portion of the screen lacked authenticity. It sounded forced fake, or like it was done merely for effect. I can't remember if the crickets stopped chirping. I just know that when I heard that crazy noise, I stopped trying to listen to them. I've been curious about it. Sasquatch or a werewolf slash dogman hybrid, perhaps? From a creepy animal to a person, something else is doing it. But nobody could delve that far. Or a screen that big. In addition, it had a live sound quality, and did not sound like a speaker system, or anything of the sort. I've considered every option. Has anyone else had a similar experience, or even had an idea of what it might have been? Okay, this incident occurred a year or two ago when I was asked to watch the neighbor's dog while they were away. For context, let me say that I reside in a very forested rural area. 
I happily comply with the neighbor's request that I stay at their home while they watch their dog Cyclone. I'm walking Cyclone along his usual route, which includes a few summertime tracking routes that connect to the neighborhood. However, since it was late fall, nobody was there in preparation for the impending snow. Of course, it's getting dark, and I'm just attempting to get everyone together so we can go inside again. He has other plans after I let him go off leash to do his thing. He walks off into the woods, and I wait about five minutes for him to come back before I follow him. As I approach him about 100 yards off the trail, I call his name and follow his trail. My patience is at an all-time low as he chews on a stick. I move over to reconnect with his lead to take him home. It turned out to be a bone rather than a stick. A substantial bone that was probably an animal leg. Since only two coyotes are in the area and the bears have already gone into hibernation, I freeze. I would get a closer look and lose it if I saw a paw still fastened to the bone. I take Cyclone and make my way back home. I take Cyclone out again the following morning, still terrified but determined to find out whose dog had apparently been taken by something. It was a deer leg, and the other half of the animal was just around the corner. It had obviously passed away naturally, and I was a complete moron for being so alarmed last night. That explains my silly backward scare, as it seems that locals can also forget that they are not the only creatures in the woods. I'm from Rhode Island and my friend and I have always been curious about the state's paranormal hotspots. There is a spooky road called Tower Hill Road in Cumberland. There are numerous paranormal tales and historical accounts of the region. The nearby residents claim to see the ghost of a young child walking a dog. There were rumors that Native Americans perished in the French and Indian War as well. So one day, we decided to travel there in our car and look around. I have been to a few locations where I could feel the weight. For some reason, I was extremely anxious, and there were times when I thought I could make out shadows in the distance. My friend started screaming that he saw something as soon as we passed this tree. I started laughing nervously, but as soon as I did, my body started to feel like lead and I could feel my fight or flight response screaming at me. I had this paranoia the entire way that someone was watching us. The road is only about a mile long, but it seems much farther. I highly recommend this one to anyone from Rhode Island or the New England region who wants to learn more about the paranormal. My brother's fiance, her child, and I decided to go backpacking in southern Indiana in January 2020. We spent the night at a shelter close to the Ohio River. My brother and my child were asleep at around 1 p.m., and my fiancé and I sat outside by the fire just talking. When my fiancé became alarmed, he pointed to numerous lights in the forest. There appeared to be five to ten people with flashlights approaching us from the outside. Before I could get my brother up one by one, the lights began to disappear. I wanted to get him up so he could see it for himself, and get his gun if necessary. The following morning, when we discussed it with him, he said it was probably lighted from the passing boats on the river. The following night, we awaited the boats to pass by once more, but none of them produced the same lights as the previous evening. It also appeared too far from the river to reflect that far into the woods based on where we saw the lights. On the third day, I was lying in the shelter when I heard what sounded like people whispering around 5 to 5.30 in the morning. At that time, everyone else was asleep. Then, through the gaps in the shelter, I caught sight of a shadow where something was. I peered out the door, but nothing was there. We have returned to that location several times since, and nothing similar has occurred. Last weekend, my friend, 
his teenage son, and I backpacked in the Allegheny National Forest in northwest Pennsylvania. We hiked the Minister Creek Trail the following day and camped about four miles from the trailhead. Only two other parties passed us that day, and neither was planning to spend the night on the trail. To find the best campsite, we thoroughly searched where we camped. Moreover, I looked for other campers within a mile in either direction but did not find any. The remainder of the forest consisted of densely forested hillsides on either side of the valley with no suitable camping spots. Then, the sound of drumming woke me up around 2 a.m. One drum appeared to provide the rhythmic beat, much like a bum. Bum. Oh, oh. Bum. If anyone is familiar with the current Cleveland Indians baseball team, the Guardians, they once had a player who would play drums that resembled a native instrument. The valley where we were camping reverberated and was very loud and close sounding. If I had to guess, I'd say it sounded about 100 yards away from where we were. My friend was also awakened by the noise when I got up and left my tent to investigate. Nothing but the shadowy woods around us could be seen. This went on for at least two hours before I could sleep again. We awoke the next morning to find everything as usual. We carried on with our hike without encountering any additional campers. What it was, I have no idea. I've seen grouse drumming on YouTube, but that was definitely not it. Of course, it could have been a person, and probably was. But what about sitting in the woods at night for at least two hours straight while playing drums without missing a beat? Perhaps this is required by some Native American ritual? I suppose the story isn't particularly spooky, but ever since Sunday morning, I've been fixated on the solution. Let me explain the shape of the woods in this story. I was in the friendly woods, the same woods I described in my previous post. Because someone had purchased our home, I mentioned it in the past tense, but I continue to reside here. I'm about to move, though. It is about half a mile long and 150 yards thick between a few homes and a quiet road. I occasionally feel as though someone is watching me while I'm here, but up until now, nothing strange has happened. Anyway, let me continue. I wasn't in the forest after the previous weekend because I had work and was generally too busy to venture outside and spend some time alone. It was in terrible shape when I went to my little camp on Monday. I built a temporary bench, which was torn apart. There was a sign and a signpost that said camp was located more than 15 feet away. The guidelines holding the tarp on top in place were cut, and I tore down a whole wall of a cabin I had made. If I recall correctly, there was only a little rain over the weekend and no storms. Strange, I thought, but perhaps some teenagers or a neighbor decided to destroy a camp to let off some steam. The harm wasn't too severe, and I took care of every issue. Today. For a game I played with some of my friends, I split some wood and cut it into small pieces. I pause and spend some time texting a friend. We discussed the forest, and I told them it wasn't scary and that I felt secure there. A terrible scream can be heard as I press the send button about 50 yards behind me, concealed behind a hill. Not even a fox howls. I am aware of those not even human. It sounded more like a woman was being murdered while a car was coming to a stop. But that wasn't the case. After turning around, I pull a knife from my belt. That was peculiar. I hear a scream as I tell my friend I'm not scared. Just curious about what you guys thought of that. Perhaps because skinwalkers were on my mind, my brain interpreted a common noise incorrectly. I'm not sure. Does anyone have any recommendations? I should start by stating that this is a true story and that I am not a skeptic. 
I know a lot about weird and paranormal things. My family is also. We all appear to have a spiritual sensitivity. My entire family has gone through some strange things. This is also not particularly dramatic. My family relocated to a small town close to Bradenton, Florida, from upstate New York. They moved, so I did. Their home is located in a remote area. It hasn't been there for very long, that. According to what we've heard, the area was once inhabited by Native Americans. My room was the only one in the house with a large sliding glass window that did not have screens and faced the outback woods. I was hesitant to look out windows, into the woods, or open my blinds when we first moved in. I started experiencing what I believed to be night terrors a few weeks after moving in. I used to wake up screaming and believe that someone or something was trying to rob me in my room. Even as a young child, I've never had this happen. Both my sleeping partner and I found it to be freaky and unsettling. At night, I started hearing knocking on my window. I initially believed I was hearing things. But after that, I started to panic badly. I never looked out the window, opened the door, or ignored it in any other way. My spouse was not aware of this. He ignored me when I told him that he was always dozing off. I simply insisted on keeping the window locked after that. Then I began to hear my next door neighbor, a friend, knocking on my window at odd night hours, whispering my name and asking if I was awake and if I wanted to go outside and smoke with her. I replied with a sleepy, no, and promised to return to sleep. She responded that she had never done anything like that when I questioned her about it, and that I was just becoming increasingly alarmed. I began to feel incredibly alone and helpless and questioned my sanity. One evening, I placed a lucky crystal on my windowsill to provide protection. Don't judge me for this, just a side note. I was uncertain as to whether this was occurring in my head or not. I was unsure of what to do to protect myself. When I awoke, the crystal was still there, broken in half, and it appeared as though lightning or another object had struck it. I occasionally noticed black figures in my room. Nothing ever took place. They would only appear to me, then disappear. Additionally, it always happened at night, when I was hardly awake. I assumed ghosts were in the house so I took a few steps to help them leave, including burning cedar wood with salt and sprinkling holy water on the walls. Our screened in back porch made a comfortable outdoor seating area. I did some meditation there while listening to the various animals and creatures. When the noises stopped, there would be nothing but dead silence. I would listen for anything, but all I would hear were the eerie sounds of branches snapping. I would immediately enter after that. I assumed it was an animal because we had raccoons, alligators, wild boars, and bobcats. Fortunately, for personal and professional reasons, I relocated back to upstate New York, so nothing else happened. A year after moving around on Halloween, I went to see my family. My sister and I stayed up late talking about spooky things while watching Pet Cemetery. When she sees me, she says, Did your father mention that he believed he had spotted a kind of thin man in the woods? I was instantly terrified and had a terrible night's sleep. The next day, when I asked my father what he had seen, he described it as a tall creature. He estimated its height at about nine feet. It was very skinny and almost resembled a black tree. It was moving through the woods in broad daylight unusually quickly and smoothly. Given that he had laser eye surgery just a few weeks prior, he reasoned that it might have been an issue with his eyes or a misinterpretation. I no longer like staying at my parents' house when I go to Florida. I am writing you this because of the strange experiences I had in Congaree National Park outside of Columbia last winter. 
Through the swamps and the cypress forests, there is a lovely boardwalk. I'm familiar with the area because I used to reside in Columbia, South Carolina. Frequent CNP. Since it's so peaceful to walk the swamp at night and hear all the wildlife, I used to jump the fence and cross the border. After hours, neither a ranger nor a guard was stationed there, so I was never alone. I last performed this action in October 2021. I was walking as I usually did while carrying my flashlight. I should point out that there is a loud sound between the insects and the frogs. But after about a mile, it abruptly came to an end. My wife wasn't at the trailhead when I heard her calling me. She was away, leaving just me. I then heard water splashing to my right. But despite using my flashlight, I saw nothing. I put it down to being tired and carried on. Soon after, the wildlife began to emerge, and everything was fine. I heard swamp water sloshing on my left, and noticed that it became eerily quiet about 15 minutes later. However, this time it seemed more deliberate, as if someone were walking. I couldn't see farther than 20 feet in front of me because I was in a dense section of the cypress. I then once more heard my wife's voice. Again, she wasn't with me and was away from the city. She had no business being in the swamp at one in the morning. I thought I saw a human silhouette move between the trees for a brief moment, but it wasn't. Off. Taller than me at six feet, very thin, and pale. I ran nearly two miles back to my truck after knocking the fuck out of there, not slowing down until I heard the wildlife once more. As I previously mentioned, this boardwalk is located in a remote swamp. Nobody ever honestly walks around in the water at night without a light. Since I have lived outside my entire life, I am unaware of any large animal that walks on two legs. I should clarify that I wasn't intoxicated or exhausted. Just the nighttime woods appealed to me. I have no doubt that I came across a crawler, Wendigo, or some other voice mimicking creature. There is no way a meth addict could have been lost in the wilderness miles from civilization. This narrative is real. At some point this summer, I'll return and take pictures to add as a reference. I've been contemplating this tale for a long time. Although it is eerie, it isn't as thrilling and terrifying as other stories I find on this site. I was hoping someone could shed some light on what might have happened. For many years, Mayan has owned a sizable plot of Northwest Connecticut, measuring more than 100 acres. Her property is situated in a state park that is primarily unpopulated and only used by hikers. We must travel through numerous forests to get to her land because it is far from any major roads. She purchased the property and made the existing, outdated house more livable. And my favorite activity has always been going up to see her. I've been going every year since I was a child and I've spent countless hours exploring the nearby woods, creeks, and land. Even though it isn't a genuine agricultural or livestock farm, we still refer to it as a farm. My aunt has previously rescued miniature horses, donkeys, alpacas, and ducks. The animals are located on a portion of the property that has been cleared out so they can graze, gain weight, and enjoy themselves. Woodlands, the rest of the farm, is unaltered. She built a 12-foot fence around the property in the early 2000s, even though it only completely encloses about 80 acres of the land she owns. She told me that she had experienced spooky encounters while living there and could not stand the sounds of the coyotes howling outside her window at night. I was still a young child, so she didn't discuss specifics. Since she lives alone, I understand why she wanted to feel secure in those remote woods. This environment was unfamiliar to us because we are from the Louisiana bayous. Nevertheless, despite my initial lack of familiarity with the terrain, 
I eventually developed excellent navigational skills. One of my favorite places from when I was a kid was a little foothill in the deepest part of the woods. I would bring my cousins with me to show them my little oasis because I would go up there so frequently that, eventually, a small path was made in the undergrowth. When I was around 10, I visited my aunts in the summer of 2008, and I took my best friend Alex along. During our formative years, she and I frequently traveled there, and she had previously accompanied me to the farm. We played Doodle Jump on our new iPod Touches while listening to Katy Perry in the woods at my favorite spot. I find it amusing to think back on this, but we were just trying to breathe fresh air and new technology. It seemed as though a suffocating stillness and silence had descended upon the woods as we were there for a while, having fun and chatting about unrelated kid-related topics. I stopped the music and turned to face Alex, who had already turned to face me with a worried and concerned look on her face. We remained motionless for a moment, tilting our heads to hear the woods and listen for any strange sounds that would typically crescendo day and night across the farm. There were no summer insects or birds, and the trees appeared frozen in place as if the slight breezes that usually ruffled their leaves had vanished entirely. I knew Alex experienced the same awful, helpless feeling. Then footsteps could be heard from even further into the woods. It took me a moment to identify the sound, but it was impossible to miss the distinct rhythm of weight being picked up and placed on leaves and brush. It was approaching us from a steep slope down the mountain or foothill. It was bipedal and heavy. I recall thinking that a person couldn't move through that area of the woods with such ease because it was so dense with growth, falling branches, trees, and rocks that it would be difficult for even a small child to maneuver, much less a large adult. The sound of these footsteps moving quickly in our direction up the steep incline gave the impression that the woods were waiting in silence. What do you hear? I whispered my question to Alex. She bowed. I continued. It sounds like footsteps. She continued to nod while displaying signs of impending tears. I grabbed her hand and started to run the improvised path with her trying not to trip or let her fall behind me in any way. Up until we came to the house, we did not stop. We probably didn't tell anyone that day because we were too terrified to even consider what might have been nearby. I asked Alex if she would accompany me back to the location the following day. She initially hesitated a lot before agreeing and telling us to look for signs of another human. We headed back, apprehensive but determined to find out what had broken into our small haven. I turned to face the direction the footsteps had come from when we finally arrived at the location. I fell a little as I looked into possible indentations in the leaves and brush. I quickly climbed up to where Alex was anxiously waiting for me because I was about to lose my nerve and had not seen much. Despite all logical evidence to the contrary, we concluded that it must have been an animal or a deer. I wanted to forget and have fun again, but I knew that did not sound like a deer. We pulled out our iPods and started the same routine of unwinding, playing video games, and chit-chatting. We quickly forgot about the terrifying experience and allowed our innocent, childlike wonder to take over because it appeared that things were back in their natural order. After a short while, the silence returned, returning so quickly that it appeared the forest had grabbed both of them and would not let go. This time, the footsteps got going pretty quickly. They were coming from a different direction and were louder. The best way I can describe their location is that they were similar to where they had been the day before but slightly further to the right, where the forest was much darker and the ascent was less difficult. I did not hesitate for too long before taking off, but it was too long before I realized the sound was coming closer and faster, certainly not a deer or a bear. I didn't delve too deeply into the woods because I was impatient to leave. 
I couldn't look because I was too terrified. I knew that it would soon be upon us if we did not run away because it was so close. I then had another thought. As quickly as we could get out of those woods, Alex and I took off. It's not a particularly thrilling tale, but that was my first unsettling encounter with those woods. I've since had more because I enjoyed the outdoors and backpack frequently. But the oddest and most mysterious things must have always happened on her land. Please leave a comment or contact me if you have any theories about what this was. Every time I am in the woods, I think about it. I still get shivers when I think about it. Additionally, our location was quite remote from the main house and other forms of civilization. When we inquired about the presence of men on the property, my aunt replied that there were none. She also stated that the gates were functional, even though a fox or bear could easily dig underneath them and open them. In Halotes, Texas, my family owns a sizable amount of land. Our ranch has a rich history, in fact. On this ranch, I was raised. A little single wide trailer belonged to my father. Mathia and Theo were our neighbors. They were a hundred yards or so to our left. I didn't really have a backyard because the back of our trailer was situated very close to some heavily wooded terrain. If that makes sense, we were dropped right in the middle of the woods, but our driveway was connected to the main dirt road. Our back door and the surrounding backyard have always made me feel uneasy. We didn't really have a backyard, as I already mentioned. It was a dense, overgrown forest. The rear door was never used. One of those chain locks was always on the inside, and it was always locked. It used to be a lot of fun. Never could I just relax and do nothing. I had to be outside discovering all the time. My cousins and I would typically ride four-wheelers, explore the ranch, and construct forts. However, there were times when I would go on my own. I recall one occasion when I explored the trailer by myself in search of a suitable location to erect a fort. At the time, I was around eight years old. I entered the trailer's right side and started to look around. There was a sizable clearing in the brush, but the back wooded area was behind me. I distinctly recall being more intently focused on locating a suitable fort site when, out of the blue, I experienced a very uneasy feeling. The back wooded area caught my eye right away. I thought I could feel eyes on me. The emotion was so strong that I made plans to return home. Other than the sensation of someone being close by and staring at me, I can't recall any other significant details about that encounter. Another time, not long after I noticed people staring at me, I returned home from my cousin's house to get some clothes because I was spending the night there at about 9 p.m. My cousin's driveway connects to the main dirt road in the same location as my driveway. Anyway, I noticed the back door was wide open once more when I opened the front door and entered the trailer. My dad was down the road at the neighborhood bar while I was staying at my cousin's house across the driveway. The trailer had been empty for several hours. Never, ever did my father ever open the back door for any reason. I was instantly terrified and made a hasty retreat back to my cousin's house, leaving the clothes I had gone there to pick up behind. On the ranch, many other things can happen but this is by far the most concerning for us. It happened in 2007 summer. At the time, we were 11 or 12 years old. We were at the home of my cousin. Earlier in the day, my father took us to Hollywood Video to rent a movie. He did this to atone for staying out at the bar until 2 a.m. We chose to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre around 1 a.m. after renting it. We decided to watch this movie at that time because we enjoyed being frightened. It was already after 2 a.m. when the movie was over. We decided to walk to my trailer 
and grabbed my boom box to listen to our CDs because we were still awake and ready to party. We simply jammed out and danced while burning on LimeWire. Keep in mind that my cousin's driveway is situated parallel to my main road and connected to it. As we continue to walk, a sudden chainsaw sound can be heard on the hill about 40 to 50 yards to our left. This is much too close for comfort. Again, it was the wee hours of the morning in a remote area. The land all around us is owned by relatives. None would use a chainsaw in the dark at two in the morning. We needed a flashlight to see the dirt road in front of us. It was that gloomy outside. We all stopped and exchanged startled glances when we heard the chainsaw. When we finally understood what was happening, we fled as quickly as we could to my trailer because, at the time, it was closer to my cousin's house. Sadly, my father wasn't home. We could not inform him of what we had just heard or request a ride back to my cousin's because he was out doing whatever he was doing. At the time, none of us had a cell phone. We ultimately decided to take my loaded 22 and proceeded to walk back carrying it. Fortunately, we didn't hear the chainsaw once more. My cousins and I still don't understand this experience. The sound of a chainsaw we heard at 2 a.m. has no logical explanation. It was strange in that it almost sounded more like a loud recording of a chainsaw than a chainsaw itself. Again. Nobody in my family would get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and start clearing brush or land or turn on recordings of chainsaws that were extremely loud. We had just finished watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so this freaks me out even more. Even though we were attempting to be alarmed, we are aware that this is real and that what we heard was not what we had anticipated. We could all clearly hear it. All at once. My cousins and I have discussed this experience with our family several times. It always surprises me how my family reacts. We were reprimanded by my father for leaving the house at that hour. My tia made a similar remark. Therefore, once it gets dark, we always tell you to go inside. A few extra details Texas has been home to our family since it was a part of Mexico. I am a member of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas and my cousins. Our past is extensive. We also have indigenous lineage, though I'm not very knowledgeable about that. Anyway, I figured I'd share my very mild, yet incredibly real and unsettling, experiences. For many years, you should have called me if you had a squirrel in your attic. For many people, I'm still that guy. Still, over the past 20 years, I've expanded to deal with other, less typical infestations. I'm now the person you contact if a Sasquatch is trampling your flower beds, or a haunted doll is rummaging through your attic. I adore my work. I've been able to travel the country, meet amazing people and experience cryptids like few others have before, thanks to the specializations I've attained. Of course, the fact that the pay is excellent doesn't hurt, but the stories are far superior. I have one more quick story for you, which is more of a PSA than anything else. I've dealt with every kind of infestation, including Sasquatches, spray human urine around the area where it is being seen to make it avoid the area and demonic presences, which almost always require the assistance of a priest, can occasionally be persuaded to inhabit a weaker organism, such as a frog and jackalope, which are merely bunnies with antlers. Put it in a cage and feed it a carrot, please. The hide behind, however, is a cryptid that has recently become more and more invasive in human settlements. The hide behind is a cryptid most frequently encountered in the northern United States and Canadian forests. In fact, I'm not sure it's even feasible to bag and tag one of these as we would typically do with other cryptids. However, I know that no hide behind has ever been killed, maimed, 
confused, or evicted from a home. On the contrary, it will defend that territory to the death once it has staked a claim to it, whether it be a local forest, a cave, or even, in one particularly bloody case, a base pro shop. The hide behind is one of the less well-known cryptids on the continent, but, without a doubt, one of the most dangerous. It was first observed by Native Americans and later by lumberjacks in the Pacific Northwest of America. Nobody truly is aware of their appearance. As the name implies, as soon as they are noticed, they quickly duck out of sight to conceal themselves behind anything nearby. They can manipulate their body to conceal themselves behind an object of any size, which would be trees and rocks in the wild. Still, in your home, it could be a corner, a kitchen cabinet, a television, or literally anything else. The few sightings that have been reported range from being described as a large bear-slash-lion hybrid to an elderly woman with frail arms and skin rashes. They are thought to be shapeshifters because of the stark contrast in their descriptions. They can alter their appearance depending on what they think will most effectively entice a potential victim to approach and investigate the sighting. Although I have no idea why the hide-behinds are moving into the suburbs, I would guess it is because their natural habitat is being destroyed, but it is a serious issue. So that you will know what to do if one enters your home, I will share this story with you now. On a Tuesday around noon, I arrived at Tim's home. He had called to inform us that there was a demonic entity in his home and that we urgently needed to get rid of it. They always insist on ASAP. Although Tim had nothing on, people today are much more demanding than they were two decades ago. I quickly looked around the house, and it was pretty clear that there was no demonic presence. Tim did not experience any reaction to the holy water or Ouija board I had brought with him, nor did he experience any typical signs of demonic hauntings, such as nightmares, sleep paralysis, or seeing any telekinetic events. He elaborated on what he had seen following further questioning. I first felt like I was being watched while watching television while sitting on the couch. When I turned to look at the screen door, I briefly thought I saw a bear peering in through the screen, but it wasn't a bear. A bear would keep staring at me or prodding at the door, but this creature hurried away as quickly as it could as though it had been trying to sneak up on me and I had seen it in the act. I was extremely bothered by it, but I simply picked up my gun, placed it on my lap, and continued to watch TV. Eventually, the feeling that I was being watched just sort of vanished. Everything was wonderful up until she arrived a few days later. The she, Tim was referring to was the hide-behind's new, human, appearance. I assume it was because there had been no response to the previous appearance of it as a bear form. Like the angler fish, the hide behind dangles something in front of you to draw you closer. As I mentioned, it wants you to look for it and get closer. It's a sluggish hunter. I had that feeling of being watched again while I was working outside in my garage. When I turn around and peer out the garage door, Nothing catches my eye, but suddenly a woman's head and shoulder appear from a garage corner. As soon as she notices that I'm staring at her, she immediately disappears around the corner where she came from. I searched everywhere this time for her. Given that I spent a year living in New York City in the 1970s, I gave her a wide berth because she appeared insane, and I didn't want her to grab me. As a result, I gave that corner a wide berth, but nobody was there. I circled the entire house, but I didn't spot anyone. Anything but footprints. Tell me that's not supernatural. It wasn't supernatural. I informed the man that it was a hide behind. I informed him that by residing on the outskirts of the city, he was a prime target for it. I told him there was no way to frighten them away or get rid of them. 
I advised him to burn the house down and never return, but he could try to leave it for at least a year, and perhaps, with luck, it would leave on its own. That response disappointed him. This house was home to three generations of my family. I'm not going anywhere and definitely not setting anything on fire. I'll let you know what I plan to do. I'll keep my shotgun close by and shoot it if I ever get that feeling again. I don't understand why it wouldn't work for this. What was it you called? Since it works for bears, the meanest creatures in this area. Behind you. I chose to be honest with him. You can't argue with someone over 65 because people become set in their ways and calcify in their beliefs. So I informed him of two things. The first thing I told him was that he would eventually get the feeling that he was being watched, grab his gun, and begin searching for the hideout, but he wouldn't find it. That happens in each of these situations because, at that point, it discovered the best hiding place it could find, directly behind you, where even if you tried, you couldn't see it. It will be too late for you at that point. The second thing I told him was that I would return in two days and that he would probably be dead by then. I then departed. Two days later, I arrived at Tim's house in my van to discover the wide open screen door flapping in the wind. I didn't even have to go through his front door to find him. He was seen all over the walls, ceiling, and floors. The odor was horrifying. I lit a match and poured some gasoline on the front porch. Within 30 seconds, the entire house was on fire. I climbed inside my van and began to back out of the driveway. I glanced at the house before moving on to the area beyond the tree line, where I briefly spotted a young boy before he quickly ducked behind a small tree. By lunchtime, I had traveled hundreds of miles. This advises you to leave your home immediately if you suspect a high behind may be present. If you can, burn the place down to prevent new occupants from moving it. These things are like bears. Once they discover a food source, they simply won't stop returning. Call your loved ones if you feel you are being watched but are unsure why because the person is standing behind you. I work as a delivery driver for a small town delivery service in the southern United States. One of their eight drivers, I deliver almost anywhere within a 25 mile radius of the city. For our protection, I won't mention the company's name or the city because it's the only one of its kind. Each of us drives a large, outdated van in varying states of disrepair. We deliver to businesses and residences sometimes in suburbs and remote areas. All of my deliveries on this particular day were made in remote locations. They justified it because I was still training and needed to become accustomed to that kind of driving to ensure my safety. However, I don't think things could have turned out any worse for me. You can become complacent, tired, and lethargic after spending a lot of time on open roads, back roads, and dirt paths. These are risky, particularly for someone like me who is accustomed to driving a small, two-door Honda Civic rather than a 10-foot tall, screaming, metal death trap. So if you were in my position and had 12 packages to deliver in a day as quickly as possible, 15 to 30 minutes between homes for deliveries, and mostly quiet back roads with little to no activity, you might experience highway hypnosis as I did. I had just over an hour and a half to deliver everything and get back to the station before dark. Three miles ago, I went by a delivery stop. I can still clearly and vividly recall what happened after that. Swearing under my breath. Shit, I berated myself for being so careless with my responsibilities. After I briefly recovered from my coma and cursed at myself, a large figure suddenly emerged from the tree line to my left and crossed the road in front of me. Shit! I screamed at this point, 
fear and adrenaline rushing through me in a static shock that seemed to make time stand still around me and my dependable, old van. I swerved just in time to miss the creature, leaving tire prints on the pavement and an ungodly screeching sound as I tried to right myself and reclaim my side of the road. My van would not fit down this long, narrow gravel driveway, at least not without a significant risk of tipping into the ditch on either side. Finally, I came to a stop outside of it. I had a package to deliver here, and I recognized the address on the mailbox at the end of the driveway. I lingered in my van for a while, trying to figure out if my anxiety and sleepiness combined for a vivid hallucination that felt real but had to be one. After all, where I live, no animals would be as large as what my mind had led me to believe I had seen, such as bears or mountain lions. I calmed down, drank water, and smacked myself awake for five minutes in my van. I kept telling myself things like, it was just your mind tricking you. And, you're tired. You've been at this for five hours and didn't sleep well. With a package in hand, I finally dared to step outside the van and start walking down the seemingly endless driveway. Of course, it only took a few minutes for me to make it down the driveway to the house, which had a few lamps scattered along it and an intriguing scent. Due to company policy, we are only permitted to deliver packages by walking up paved driveways unless there is no other way to reach the customer-specified delivery location. But I believe it might have saved my life in this particular instance. I moved faster than one might consider a walk down the driveway, and when I reached the customer's door, I softly knocked. I used the customer's nickname, which my co-workers gave him, to protect his privacy. Delivery to Mr. One-Eye, please. There are many tales about old One-Eye that my co-workers have told me, but the majority of them have something to do with how strange old One-Eye is. Since I first heard the stories about old One-Eye, I've never delivered to him, but have always been curious to meet him. According to the tales he has told my co-workers, he is an elderly Navajo Native American medicine man. The ragged remains of something were in the front yard as I waited outside old One-Eye's front door. It was straw and broken wood logs, as best as I could tell in the dim light. Maybe there's a shed in front of old One House. The eyes, why would he destroy it? After this, I didn't give it much thought and knocked again, louder this time. One-Eyed Mister, your package is outside, I promise. Are you inside? Only one electric light was on the old man's porch, and it looked like it might soon go out. It's surprising, considering that lamps provided the majority of the light on the property. One, it appeared unfueled, was on the porch. The door began to creak open as I gave it another knock, apparently harder than I had intended. Mr. One-Eye? I support the delivery service. Although I didn't intend to, I kind of opened your door. My nostrils were suddenly attacked by a terrible odor. The unholy scene was set up inside when I fully opened the door. I saw a tall figure move in the dim light of the house. I observed Old One-Eye or, more precisely, what once was Old One-Eye. He appeared to have been attacked by something that intended to do more to him than just hurt or eat him. His clothes had been almost completely torn off in the front, his torso and face had been ripped to pieces, and his living room had been destroyed. Oh God, I can't bear to tell you about it. But I noted what was currently in the room with him. It appeared as though a wolf had an unholy child with a crocodile. The born creature stood on two wolf legs, had a crocodile's scaly exterior mixed with dark, coarse fur and had its gaping maw filled with teeth. There were so many teeth, so many teeth in a wolf's mouth that were inappropriate. They were crooked and hooked, and some appeared to be engaged in a power struggle within the wolf's mouth, 
shoving one another aside as they grew into one another. If there is an afterlife, then perhaps for all of eternity will be imprinted in my mind the image of this creature. However, I did notice something even worse. The one-eye old one I had left was hooked into one of its, for lack of a better word, hands. It's. It appears this monster had a grudge against the previous medicine man. I was at a loss for what to do and what to think because I knew I couldn't save him. After all, he was already dead, and I believed I couldn't save myself. Even in this life or death situation, I was still required to abide by my employer's rules, so I dropped the package and sprinted down the stairs from his door and down the walkway to the driveway. In old one home, eyes, I turned around to find a blood-curdling, nearly audible screech behind me. One soul-crushing cry sounded like a woman pleading for her life a wolf howling, and the meadow rubbing against metal. When I reached the driveway, I was quickly followed by footsteps and the sound of claws scraping against stone. To protect my vital areas, I dove down out of instinct. However, the impact of landing on the gravel not only cut me but also knocked the wind out of me. I struggled to breathe, gasping for air in the gravel driveway as my lungs ached from the lack of oxygen. I had anticipated passing away or a nefarious being making a slow approach to enjoy my death. Never happened. I looked up after a few seconds of catching my breath and running for my life. The creature was there, hovering unnaturally close to the edge where the walkway and driveway converged. Nothing moved closer. Initially, I believed it was simply taking its time and enjoying the prospect of stalking and killing me, but it never did. It merely stood still. They occasionally pace or lunge in my general direction but never get past the lanterns. The combination of the aches and pains, the waning effects of the adrenaline, and the knowledge that I was safe somehow overwhelmed me, and I passed out. I can only recall waking up just before today's sunrise and seeing the sky turn light. In old one driveway, eyes my back and neck were unbearably stiff and painful. I stood in a daze as if possessed, took a lamp from the driveway, and headed for my van. I saw that the van had numerous large gashes and the passenger side window had been broken. To make sure whatever it was hadn't set up shop in the van to surprise me, I inspected it thoroughly. I entered the driver's side door of the car after ensuring I was secure and let out a breath I wasn't even aware I had been holding. The day's events left me speechless, and I sobbed uncontrollably in the car for an undetermined amount of time. I glanced at my phone. My boss missed 15 calls. He could wait, though, while I reported the mauling of the medicine man to the police. I told them that a starving coyote did it because I could not tell them that a creature nearly as tall as my van, and so bizarre that it seemed to have come from the gates of hell itself had mauled him. I was the only witness, so they came to the old man's house and interrogated me, which obviously looked bad on me. However, after seeing the man's body and the condition of my van, they realized that no human being could have committed such a heinous act. They claimed it was likely a pack of hungry coyotes, and I must not have remembered correctly that only one coyote could not have carried out such an act. I merely nodded, pretending I couldn't recall much of the previous night's activities and was shocked. They explained the situation to my boss over the phone and promised to call him later when they had called paramedics for me. As soon as my boss arrived to collect the now damaged to hell van, I left for the hospital, where I am currently typing this. Because I can see the creature in this story, I felt compelled to share it. It's there when I close my eyes to go to sleep. It twists into the creature for a split second when I stare at a spot of darkness. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I notice it. It remembers who I am, so I know it's coming for me. It may have remembered old one eye. I believe. 
I believe that after taking his eye, it returned to kill him. I don't know, maybe it had a grudge against him. I simply know that I'm coming next. It gets more vivid every time I see it somewhere. It was just an hour ago. The tree line across the road shifted as the sun started to set as I looked out the hospital window. I noticed the same intriguingly comforting aroma when I lit the lamp. I'm secure, at least temporarily. I have no idea how much time I have left before the lamp goes out, and it has a chance to get me. I just want people to be aware of this in case it also affects them. Garlic, cactus flower and ginseng are placed inside the lamps. Unless I get more kindling for the lamp before it gets to me, I won't be able to hold it off indefinitely. Even so, I could simply be delaying the inevitable. In 2022 my wife and I spend our honeymoon in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley National Park. As soon as we got to town, we were eager to go on an early evening hike. Around 6 p.m., in a heavy mist with cloudy skies, we were traveling to a hike along Skyline Drive. We came across a strange-looking lone man on the road a few hundred yards before the trailhead. My wife and I both remarked on how strange he appeared. You know, messy, deserted-looking, etc. We made the 1.5 mile hike up the mountain to the at, which marked the trail's end. My wife paused to relieve herself, and we both calmed down before turning to walk back down to our car. The man we had earlier passed on the road emerged from the fog. He was unassuming and had one of those standard hatchet and hammer multi-tools by his side. It wasn't just being carried, he had raised it a bit. It becomes spookier. As we passed him, he said that he had discovered a set of teeth the last time he was up there. He awkwardly acknowledged what he had said. He jittery laughed, and then hurriedly began to descend toward our car, looking in our direction to see if he had turned to follow us. We started running down the mountain once we were 100 feet away. Every few minutes, we would pause to listen, slash, and watch what was happening. It was frightening. Undoubtedly, we returned to our car, but we were uneasy. A few weeks later, we would learn that someone had been detained in connection with the homicide that had occurred nearby while we were there. <laughs> 